Hello, it's Tim. Hi, Tim. Hey. Hi, hold on, you haven't seen me, here we go. I'm so sorry. Don't worry about it. I mean, what happened was, you, did you see that that Sarah booked the ticket? And she booked a ticket even though it said this ticket is still is now not available because Eventbrite, you can't, once you've launched an event, you can't then delete ticket types. Uh-huh, right. So hold on, I'm just gonna kill that. Okay, Google, off. Oh. <laughs> oh, you've got one of them. Um we've so got, we've got several so that, people wanting to come in. So uh are you are you managing this because we yeah. don't have Adam? Yeah. Are we haven't got Adam, no? No, I I'm man I'll manage it all, but I'll wait till five. Okay, so these people are waiting to be admitted. Yes. Uh that we don't have a green room we can put us, uh, us. I, I'm making it right now. Oh, you oh, are? Yeah. Oh, Adam. Hello, SP London. <laughs> Apologies. I I hate <laughs> going to work because I have to re-cable everything when I come back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How are you, Tim? Have you recovered? I'm completely recovered. Oh, that's uh, fantastic. Absolutely, absolutely fine. Um, took for, uh, 14 days of, uh, or I think it was 13, 14 days of, positive tests and then two you know that after after day seven you can actually um you're not infectious anymore that's, i don't agree well that's that that's according to my friend who runs the intensive care unit at yeah, East well, I, had, I had symptoms like i had i had uh, i had symptoms of illness uh chest cough all sorts okay of well and maybe. The, and so what do you think about boris then ripping part. it all up then <laughs> what do you think about what do you think about it all being ripped up now then I think it's most unwise. I think the least you should do is in, insist on on uh, keeping social distancing and masks on because um, they work. Uh, but you know, um, I don't, you know, the rest of it can go. I don't. I don't see the reason of the isolation. I mean, most people when they've got flu or a serious cold, they isolate, um, and that that can. That I can think more so now. I think work. gone are the days you're going to go to work with a streaming cold and really hacking cough. Absolutely agree. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's, not that's, what we used to, that's what we used to do. We used to feel we had to go we to work. We have a speaker in. Apologies. That, what is the name of the speaker? I'm just trying to Andrew, scaffold. Andrew through. Woods. Andrew Woods. Uh, Andrew Woods. Don't have him yet. Okay. I'll see if I can. So I will connect the Zoom to the... Because I have only the sponsor slides on my work laptop. So I will just... I'll give you that. Andrew Woods... Um, uh, no, I was just going to say, I'll give you his, he's got two emails. Oh, you know the emails, because of course you email. Yes, yes. Yeah, no, you know them, yeah. <clears throat> so, geothermal, geothermal. Got it, let's be on the section. You guys are going to discuss on Thursday about the way forward for the next three events. Yeah. 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 Definitely. So, Andy and John. Okay. I don't see them in. Okay, and let me get light of some sort. <clears throat> then I will move us into a green room. Yeah, okay, fine. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, I, to be honest, I, yeah, we can, we can chat on Thursday, but I think, Kate, you're right. It, we, we should deliver value to the members if maybe the, the in-person bit might be separate from the technical lectures. Yeah, that but might. Why, be. why didn't you think about doing a sort of networking summer party? Not a not a exactly. Thing, but... So so that's in the works with Percy, in some kind of spring. So he was thinking about March. I'd uh, say that's a bit early. You think so? Yeah, yeah I do as well. <laughs> you know, look at look. <laughs> yeah, we you'd expect to get. 20 people signing up for an event you know and i don't i can't imagine it's gonna happen in march um okay. you need i've got the ideal place you go to the october gallery which has got an outside space which makes people nice there, isn't it? feel yeah. it is nice i'm doing an event i'll invite you both i'm doing an event on april the 20 28th but it's weird all the journalists are all back they're absolutely they're all our events are they're hybrid but they're full in person it's funny isn't it it depends on the industry, I think. It does, it really does. But I think a spring party, as in spring summer party. Yeah. And I just think it's just it's too messy to keep changing and I don't yeah, really feel it's now an imperial. Yeah. Yeah. And to be honest, you, you, you a 
especially with this event, you can see the massive disparity. If we have 150 people and only three want to go in person, that's that's a clear message. Yeah, okay, so. everyone's got the damn link in the end. Uh, you've actually got 238 people signed up for this. Okay. But I know. Yeah. I know you have a massive dropout. You know, so it has to be with a pinch of salt. Oh, we'll see. I mean, a lot of those people are because they're not they're not London members. They're international members. How many London members were there? In fact, did you? Do you have a chance to see when you did that last email thing? The London one. Yeah, how many London I, members are there? I don't know. It doesn't, I, I don't have it, it doesn't tick. Okay. The okay. box, it doesn't have, I can do that in the future. Are you a member or non-member or? Well, no, it's not that. It's just that because it was advertised globally, then, uh, and it's such an important topic globally, that, that I would expect the majority of the people to uh, to be attending are from other countries. Oh, we'll see one. Yeah, that's why that's, I, I didn't realize you hadn't really appreciated that because that's why I was saying that you know you need to make sure it's um it's not London centric. Yeah, yeah. And and so anyway, past. Okay. But if it's going to be recorded, yeah. then maybe we can make it available for people. Thank you. 
Sadece şey çok önemli değil ya. Başlasın. Ben dinleyeceğim şu an itibariyle. <gülüyor>
Yeah, my apologies. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for attending. And uh, we are expecting quite a few more people to attend, but um, maybe maybe they will join as we go on through. So there'll be a bit of a distraction. Um, but be that as it may, I think we'll, we'll start now. We're around, just around on time. And uh, Andy Woods, uh, as you know, is our first speaker. And I'll, I'll just read a little bit from his, uh, his bio and his talk just to refresh your memories as to uh, the nature of the discussion. Um, so uh, Andrew's uh, talk is Geothermal Energy, Some Fluid Flow Challenges. And in this talk, uh, Andy will discuss some of the potential for geothermal energy production, focusing on the fluid mechanics and the heat transfer, assessing the different approaches to extracting energy in both open and closed systems, given the renewed interest which has developed in developing deep systems for power generation. He will also address some of the challenges for ground source heat pump systems, especially in high po highly populated areas where dense arrays of boreholes may be required. Andy studied maths at St. John's College, Cambridge, followed by a PhD in DMTP, Cambridge, on geophysical fluid dynamics. Two years as a research fellow at St. John's College and as a green scholar at the IGPD, PP, San Diego, before taking up a lectureship for five years at the Institute of Theoretical Geophysics in Cambridge. After three years as Professor of Applied Mathematics at the University of Bristol, he was elected the BP Professor and Head of the BP Institute, University of Cambridge. He was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society in 2017. Andy, the floor is yours. Well, thank, thank you very much. I'll, I'll just put my slides up. Um, that's a, uh, continue, sorry. Um, thank you, is that, are, the, are these slides all, all up? Um, yeah. okay. All visible. All yeah, visible. Great. Oh, well, thank, well, thank you very much for the um, very generous invitation um, to come and talk to you this evening. Um, I, I thought I would uh, go through a series of um, the different types of flow modelling um, problems associated with geothermal energy production and um, talk about some of the research we've been doing um, in, in Cambridge on some of these challenges. And um, in particular, the, the, the challenges of the, the complexity of many of the permeable rocks in which the heat is stored, and then talk about how this is um, informing some of the recent developments in geothermal um, power production. Um, so um, please do interrupt as we go through if there are questions. Um, so to start off with, I just thought I'd um, put, put down a, a couple of slides, just noting the, um, the, the, I guess the origin behind the, the present renewed interest in geothermal is really that we're, as, as we're aware, we're trying to decarbonize the energy system and presently, um, geothermal energy is only a very small fraction, 0.1% um, or smaller of the global energy supply. Um, and yet it's got a, there's a huge potential um, to mine the heat in the earth and um, generate, um, you know, get a lot of power production, but also have um, lower temperature, lower grade um, thermal energy for um, heating systems. Um, so, um, this, this plot just shows the um, prevalence at the moment of hydrocarbons and the need to actually try and generate a number of different sources um, of renewables and other sources of, of energy production to replace the present enormous um, fraction of the energy system, which is um, generated from hydrocarbons. And just to put some uh, le lens on this, if we look at the, um, the next slide, what we can see here is the um, sort of a, a a possible projection forward into the ways in which the energy may be sourced um, in the future. And what we can see is the, um, there's a whole series of different um, sources of potential sources, but with the other and other renewables, I think are the boxes in which geothermal presently sits. And yet this has got you know, considerable potential um, going forward to be um, you know, play an important role, particularly in, in, in certain areas of the world where they have a lot of hot um, ground near, near the surface. Um, so uh, what we're interested in tonight is trying to understand some of the challenges and um, issues associated with growing these um, other boxes in this, in this picture. And, and just for context, a lot of the new energy production will be produced by wind and solar power. And as we can see here on the, this slide here, this is just showing um, up to 2020, the enormous growth in renewables and 
Um, you can see both in terms of geographic location, but also type of renewables. Um, wind is, you know, the, is sort of winning the lead at the moment. There's a lot of solar renewable, renewable power generation, um, but there's, um, given the, the nature of the challenge, the enormity of the challenge, um, thinking about geothermal where it may have a, a big role is very important because, it, uh, and of course these numbers are extremely big. So when we look at these graphs and see the, the, the global challenge, um, of course, uh, Power, power generation locally um, can, can still be an extremely large scale operation. So I think geothermal still has an important role to play. So um, what, and, and just for contrast, we can see that nuclear power hasn't been growing and um, sort of um, so sort of hydro, hydroelectric power has been growing in um, the Far East, but elsewhere that's sort of saturated. So. Um, but geothermal power really has a, you know, a big role to play. So this, this chart just shows some of the global uses of or global power production, um, geothermal energy around the globe. And we can see the US is by far and away the dominant um, country generating geothermal power today um, with a lot of the power in the, the West. But there's, there's also other areas where there's a lot of um, hot subsurface ground, the Philippines, Indonesia, um, and of course, New Zealand and Iceland. So, um, and, and one of the interesting issues, which I think Iceland has really been pioneering, is the fact that um, if you have a lot of um, power generation, you can actually bring industry to that power generation and, and use the power um, for aluminium and other, other industries. So, I, so there's a very interesting idea about bringing industry to the source of the power, um, which is perhaps different from um, when, when the nature of the power sources change um, from hydrocarbons, which are obviously very transportable. Um, but um, as we see from this chart, the, the growth of um, geothermal hasn't been um, as rapid as it could be, and, um, but, the, but there are projects happening. And um, you know, so I'd say I think this this chart just shows how it's it's down at order 0.1 percent of global power. In the in the UK, focusing on the UK, we have you know the, the ground has different temperatures around the UK, but Cornwall is particularly attractive for geothermal power. And there was the hot dry rock project um, that, that was developed. 20 to 30 years ago, and there's a, a new project being developed um, at the Eden Project now in some of this very hot granite. Um, and um, just to show this, there's a, a well that's just being drilled um, just uh, north of the Eden Project site, and it's five kilometers deep. So this is very deep um, geothermal into the fractured granite uh, at that depth. And the plan here is to try and um, extract heat by drilling two wells, but there's just the first well has been drilled. And the, the idea is to put a coaxial pipe down that well and um, in a pump and then bring the water back up the same, the same well and use that as a, a test in the first instance until the second borehole has been um, drilled. And then it'll be possible to drive a net flow through the system. Um, but just looking down at this chart of Cornwall, we can see how the heat production is very variable, but there's an extremely high, well, high heat production in, in parts of central Cornwall, where um, there does seem to be a lot of potential. And um, in, in this site, the idea is this will become a power plant to actually generate um, power. The, the, the um, temperature goes down to about 180 degrees, I think. Um, and so you know, very hot, hot um, fluids can be extracted from this system. And a lot of the challenge lies in trying to understand the flow paths through the fractures, particularly at these very high pressures, and whether as cold water is injected and migrates through the structure, whether that actually leads to um, flow focusing and um, changes in the fracture permeability because of the heat, heat transfer. Um, so I think there's a number of interesting challenges that will, be, will emerge from this project. Um, but I, but I really wanted to talk about some sort of general fluid mechanical principles um, about geothermal energy and geothermal heat production, um, just to see some of the challenges associated with trying to model and predict um, heat recovery from geothermal systems. And so this, this cartoon just shows a sort of generic um, geothermal plant where there'll be a series of pipes bringing up hot water and then um, collecting it in a, a station, passing it through a turbine to generate power. Um, and um, I think what I wanted to talk about was the, the nature of the challenges. So what, one of the challenges in, in geothermal systems is that um, you, as you draw out hot water from the system, um, the system typically, if it's an open system, it needs to be recharged. And so additional water needs to be pumped back in. 
And this can lead to a lot of very interesting challenges about um, how effectively that recharge of the system will work, where the injected water goes. And a lot of the technology from oil and gas in terms of drilling wells um, can be adopted. But um, the production of scale and other um, precipitates can obviously be um, very um, difficult in, in geothermal plants. Um, so, you know, the typical power generation, um, the steam turbines produce about 11 gigawatts globally. And then low, low grade heating um, today produces about 21, 8 gigawatts of power. Um, so, and the, the and of course, this has all been drawn off the geothermal um, temperature gradient in the earth, which may be 25 to 30 degrees C per kilometer. So obviously, the deeper you go, the hotter the system, but the more challenging in terms of very high pressure and, um, and of course, higher temperature. Um, and the costs for onshore um, depends on, on the challenge of the, the nature of the rock. But if it's um, impermeable rock, it can be more expensive than drilling. Um, in, in, in other, other industries. Um, but the you know, typical numbers for power generation, about 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and there's a lot of interest in, in generating new, new geothermal power. So uh, this, this slide just shows the historical data from one power plant showing from 1990 up to 2010, um, how it can provide you know, a very substantial source of um, power generation. And there is a gradual decline over time um, and of course, some of that can be um, addressed by um, continual recharge. But actually, predicting and modelling um, the evolution of these systems is can, can be um, challenging. Um, so I just so I thought I'd, I'd spend the rest of this talk really really looking at some of the fundamental physics of injection into geothermal systems, and and, and then perhaps move on to look at some of the emerging technologies associated with um, analogous technologies such as aquifer heat storage and um, gr you know, ground source heat pumps. So the, 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 the sort of typical traditional idea in geothermal power is that you, you have a hot rock permeable layer of rock, perhaps with some seal layer above it, and um, cold water, well, well hot, hot water is obviously extracted, but in order to regenerate the power, cold water will be injected into the system. And um, the, the idea would be to, to have a net flow through the system, um, mining the heat as, as the water travels through the system. Um, and the typical temperatures might be 150 to 350 degrees. So obviously when the, when the fluids come up, they'll be at high pressure and typically they'll flash at some point and it'll be um, a steam, steam production. But there may be a lot of minerals that are produced with this, which can lead to reactions both in the system, but also at the surface. Um, which can lead to um, some very substantial challenges associated with maintaining um, these, these um, systems running. Um, and this is just a, a picture of one of the power plants. Um, I think this is from the, the geysers in Italy, in, in um, Northern California. So, so the first issue about re-injecting, and really I wanted to focus on this issue of injecting water into the system and trying to model where that water goes <clears throat> and understand the flow paths and, and actually the fraction of the um, reservoir, the hot reservoir that you, you'd be able to access and mine heat from. And a lot of it's about the challenge of water short circuiting through the system or propagating along a, 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 only a fraction of the rock so that not all of the thermal energy in the system can be um, carried to the production wells and actually advected and produced. And um, of course, I, I should, should just note that thermal diffusion um, in these systems is very unlikely to have a, an important impact on the sort of commercial timescales of, of years, given the, the rate of heat conduction. So it's really about advecting the heat through the system by driving flow th through the system. Um, I, 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 I yes. lost the clarification there because you talked about advection and we can talk about convection as well. Do you want to clarify the difference between the various terminologies? Oh yeah, okay. So so, so I'll, I'll come back to this. So, so advection is, which is mainly what I'll be talking about, is actually where you're injecting water and it's migrating through the porous system and that carries um, heat, heat flux with it. So it advects that, so it's been carried by the flow. Convection um, is the state of having um, fluid motion induced by temperature gradients. So if we have, a hot, in, as we move down the geotherm and the temperature increases, water um, lower down in a formation will be warmer and it may be less dense than the water above that and that may lead to that water rising and the, the water above it sinking and so you get a, 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 um, a circulation pattern which, ten, which tends to make the temperature uh, more uniform in that layer 
Um, and of course, that convection does carry heat vertically um, with, as, as that fluid moves up and down. Um, and, but typically, you'd be mining the heat from that system by um, drawing the water out, and the water would carry the, um, the heat thermal energy with it. But if, if you have impermeable rocks surrounding the formation, um, then the, the rate of heat conduction through those permeable rocks um, is very slow. So the, the, the natural recharge time, um, once you've mined the heat from the um, permeable system, um, will be you know, many tens of years um, or longer. Um, the thermal diffusivity being about 10 to the minus seven or several multiples of 10 to the minus seven. So we're only talking about diffusing heat distances of meters in um, a period of years. So um, you're not actually going to be able to mine a lot of the heat in the impermeable rock around. Um, but I will come back to this when we look at closed systems later on. Um, so, so I guess the challenge with, with these systems is actually what fraction of the permeable rock are you able to access and what, what does the flow path look like? And we've been doing a lot of work um, looking at this system and, and the, the issue about convection does become very important because the, the temperature differences can lead to density changes in the water. But in, in addition to that, typically the water that you'll source at the surface um, may come from a variety of sources, but it may not have the same composition as the water in the, in the reservoir. So this, this um, aquifer water may be saline um, with some natural um, concentration of, of, of different um, salts, but the, the, surf, the surface water that you access, you, you might recycle some of the water, but you might also be accessing water from rivers or other surface sources, and that may tend to be of different density. And, and so when the fluid goes into the reservoir, it's going to have different, a different density from the fluid in the system, and that's going to lead to um, a sort of buoyancy effects um, impacting the flow as well as the pressure drive on the flow. And that's going to be a large theme about my, um, the, the rest of my talk. So, so the first point is that if we're injecting into a, a permeable system, and this is the Bridport sandstone um, then on the, on the south coast in Dorset, um, and if, we were, if, if this was um, a, a formation in a geothermal system with a, a seal above it, and we were going to imagine mining the heat in this system, that the formation um, uh, and many of these geological formations consist of many layers that are laid down. So this, this is about 90 meters in height. Um, kilometers in the lateral scale, but each of these layers may only be a few meters in thickness, and then there's less permeable um, pre precipitate layers between these um, refined, slightly finer grain materials. So this is a very layered and baffled rock, and this may be typical of many of these systems. And if you're injecting into this rock and then um, mon monitoring where that fluid travels um, as it travels towards an extraction well um, to, to mine the heat, um, it may not travel along the um, just a sort of simple horizontal pathway, but there may be some um, effects of the, the fact that the water you inject, if it's relatively fresh, it may be less dense than the saline water in, in the system. And so it'll depend on the temperature contrast compared to the, um, the density contrast from the um, different mineral composition. But that can, if, if the fluid you inject is less dense, and we have a series of baffles in this, may, maybe which are fractured, or provide an imperfect seal. It could be that the plume of water you inject as it spreads through the system actually migrates along baffles and then tries to rise up through the system, um, continuously accessing breaks in the seal and producing a plume of injected water that this has a very different um, topology from um, a simple um, fluid rising through the system. Um, and, and so we've done some experiments having a look at some of these effects. Um, so this is an experiment in a Healy Shore cell where we have a series of baffles. Um, this is just looking at a system upside down where we're injecting fluid and it's sinking under gravity as, as these systems will eventually become once they travel far enough from the injection well. And um, what you can see here is that the, this develops a plume that spreads out in the horizontal direction, um, even though the, the main force is the, the vertical buoyancy force. And um, this, this particular flow path, um, the, since the flow partitions over each of these baffles and becomes equally partitioned um, across each baffle, um, the, the distribution of fluid moving through each of these channels here um, essentially follows a, a binomial distribution. And um, if you look at that over a large, a large number of these baffles, it basically follows a, a Gaussian. So it essentially acts like a dispersion process. So we have a horizontal dispersion acting from this 
heterogeneous structure of the, the layered medium. And so this may be an effect that leads to um, a you know, particular spread of the injected water if it's got a different composition from the um, water in the system. And so you, you may be bypassing large parts of the um, system. And, and so actually looking at the fraction of the thermal energy that you can recover um, would be an interesting um, issue. And if the layer is inclined, so if it's a tilted layer with the same sort of structure, then what you find is that the, the flow will um, partition asymmetrically um, along each of these baffles. And when it finds leaks up to the, and goes through the next layer, these um, buoyant type flows um, will tend to drive a plume that moves at a particular angle um, through the medium, not, not vertical, but actually at some, some other angle as it moves through the system. So characterizing the, the sort of the, the sedimentary structure of the reservoir is going to be very important in terms of trying to predict how these flows migrate. And another effect that happens, which can be very important in geothermal systems, is that um, if you if we have heterogeneities, such as, for example, here, this is a series of cross-bedded um, formations where there may be bedding planes and, and they may, and this, is, this is a very small scale, and this is a larger scale, but the bedding planes of the, the cross-bedded um, formation may vary depending on the, the geologic history of the, the sedimentation. So we may get a very complex um, rock structure. And of course, if you're putting this into a, a reservoir simulator or other calculation tool to model the flow, you, you kind of assign this a, a, a permeability, um, an effective horizontal and effective vertical permeability. But in, in practice, um, the, the flow um, may be somewhat different. So as a very simple more ex example of this, if we imagine we have a layer um, where we have cross bedding as shown here, so we have a permeability K1 in across the layers and K2 along the layers, and we just drive a flow through this system. So this would just be a pressure driven flow through the system. Then um, in order for the flow to move through this layer, um, and, and if we just imagine it's got a, a seal layer above and below, in order to move through, the, the pressure gradient is not actually directed in the X direction, but it's in some other direction because of this anisotropic permeability. And um, so what, what you can see is that it, the, the, the flow, if, if K2 is a bigger permeability than K1, the flow naturally tends to want to run down in this direction. And so there needs to be a, a vertical pressure gradient to oppose that flow. And that leads to a, a net distortion of the pressure contours. So they're actually um, in this direction here, um, as seen on the slide. So if you imagine now that you have a, a series of um, cross-bedded layers that are connected together, and so in this, this is just a very simple simulation showing um, an interface between a layer that's homogeneous and a layer that's cross-bedded and another layer that's homogeneous. If we have a flow going through this and we, we just look at how a tracer moves through this, um, as we go through this interface between this layer of rock here and this layer of rock there, the um, pressure contours need to change from being perpendicular to the flow to being at some angle to the flow, as, as we see in this cross-bedded layer, and then they return back to being vertical. And the consequence of that is that there's, there's an adjustment in the <clears throat> pressure contours um, at the top and bottom of the layer, which leads to an acceleration of the um, fluid at the top compared to the bottom. And we get a shearing of the, the tracer. So this, this red line is tracking out um, the, the, the um, if you like, it's the a, a tracer of the flow pattern. And then when we go through the next boundary, if we have a, a, a rock with a series of these boundaries in, um, then we get the opposite effect. And, the, and so we end up getting a net, net distortion of the dye like this. And so ultimately there's a net shear that develops in the layer. And that shearing effect is very important if we're, then, if we're looking at how does that transport temperature? Because if, the, if this flow is carrying the, the thermal energy in the rock downstream, it's going to carry the thermal energy more rapidly in the, the center of the formation than the edges. So if it's cold water we're injecting, we're going to get a cold layer running down the middle. And that will, um, as this interface spreads out, we're going to get a lot of cross-layer diffusion. And that's going to cause a spreading or smearing of the um, temperature interface between the hot and the cold water. Um, and an analogous effect occurs if we have baffles, if we have inclusions either of low permeability. This is a <clears throat> just a picture showing some flow going through a layer with low permeability inclusions. This is one showing a picture with high permeability inclusions. And in both cases, we end up getting a distortion of the flow field, um, which again has the net effect of a shear of, uh, across the flow so that um, temperature gradients, we're going to start generating uh, vertical temperature gradients as a result of this horizontal flow. And um, we can do a, a simple calculation to look at how that changes the effective 
thermal diffusivity or thermal conductivity in the direction of the flow. So if, if we imagine that we have um, a, a system um, of um, baffles in the layer um, where we get very slow flow into these baffles, then the flow will come along and it'll bypass these, these zones of low permeability. But there'll be heat diffusion into those. So this is cold water we're injecting, displacing hot water. Th these are going to cool down and um, the, um, the, the fluid here is going to advance and, and start contacting hotter, hotter zones downstream. So if we want to try and model how quickly heat diffuses through the system, what we can do is we can look at the effective flow speed of the flow as it moves outside the baffles, outside these zones. And that flow speed um, is, um, so, so the actual mean speed um, is related to the flow through these high permeability layers. And so if we're then looking at heat conduction through this system, um, what we're going to have is we're going to have, um, we, we can look at the mean temperature in our layer, because ultimately if we have a production well, that's going to sample the mean temperature. So if we look at the mean temperature averaged across the layer, um, so we're just averaging in the, the cross flow direction, that would be an estimate of the, the mean temperature. And that mean temperature is carried downstream. Um, and so this, this gives you the effective equation that we should put in our simulator to model the heat flow through this sort of layer where we're not accessing the heat in these layers. So the temperature will evolve in time. It'll be advected downstream, and that advection um, will be associated with the, this Darcy flow through um, the, the, the layers between the baffles. Um, and if we're looking at this, the, the mean transport, there's, there's some diffusion, but there's also a term because of the shearing, because we have no flow here and we have a high speed flow here. And that shearing leads to a, a temperature gradient, um, a perturbation temperature gradient, and that the combination of the fluctuation in the flow speed across the layer and the fluctuation in the temperature gradient across the layer can lead to a net transport. And that net, we can calculate that net transport which ends up being a diffusive um, transport or a dispersive type effect, um, which can be very important for the heat transfer. So, um, so here's our, our temperature equation again. And what we're interested in is actually trying to predict this dispersive term. Well, if we think about this flow going through the layer, then in the, the, there's going to be a, a cross layer temperature gradient, which is going to diffuse heat. So there's going to be some perturbation temperature where we're diffusing heat. And that's going to be balanced by um, the, the spreading out of the temperature in the direction of the flow because of the, the variations in velocity from the mean. So if we have a region of fluid moving more quickly, that's going to carry cold water quickly forward, and that cold water will become in contact with hotter fluid and it'll then diffuse in the cross flow direction. And so we're going to expect to see a balance between the shearing or the, these, temp these velocity fluctuations in the flow direction and the diffusion in the cross flow direction. And if we write that equation down, we can then solve for the size of these cross flow temperature fluctuations in terms of the fluctuate, the shear and the velocity. And so with this simple example, we're getting no flow and flow. And so we can calculate that. And when we calculate that, we find an effective dispersion term. So just popping back this term here associated with the shear plus the, the, the um, fluctuations in the temperature gradient leads to an effective diffusion. And that effective diffusion term is shown here. And so we have to add that onto the thermal diffusivity. And this term here may be 10 or 100 times larger, depending on the particular heterogeneity of the system, than the, than the basic thermal diffusivity. So what this is going to do is it's going to smear out the thermal front between our cold water and the hot water as it spreads through the system. And of course, that's going to mean that the when, when that water starts becoming near the production well, we're going to have a gradually decreasing temperature of produced fluid rather than a sharp front, which is, is obviously not, not ideal in terms of um, power generation. And similar effects are going to happen if we're looking at aquifer thermal storage. So we're looking at heat storage in aquifers um, for interseasonal heat storage. The, the recovery temperature, and I'll come on to this a little bit later, but this dispersion effect can have a very big impact in degrading the, the temperature of the recovered fluid compared to having a more sharp thermal contact between the injected fluid and the fluid that we're recovering. So that, that's sort of one, one effect. But the next effects I wanted to talk about were all related to um, the thermal inertia of the, the porous layer and the effect of this thermal inertia on how fluids move through the layer when we, we may have density contrasts. So what this series of pictures at the top on the right-hand side show are, uh, it's a, a laboratory experiment. So this is a porous layer, 
And in this porous layer, we have um, hot, we, we sort of initially have um, cold water, and then at the top, we are injecting hot water. And um, that, so the red is hot water and the, the clear is um, cold water, but we've dyed the hot, the hot water red. And then in the center, there's this black strip, and this is a liquid crystal strip, which records, uh, it changes color at a particular temperature. And the temperature it changes color at is the temperature that's between the hot and the cold temperature. So I think the hot water was at about 35 degrees and the cold water was the lab temperature of about 20. And this temperature strip here is at about 27. And what we see as time goes on in this experiment, as the red fluid drains through the tank, displacing the clear fluid, is that the dye, the red dye moves faster through the pack than the thermal front. Okay, so this is showing the effect of thermal inertia in the porous medium. And this is really, really a fundamental point. And um, what's happening here is that the, the hot water that's coming in, as if we imagine here, this hot water is coming into the system, this is temperature and distance. And um, the water that's come in um, near the, near, near the um, inflow point, it's hot, and then and we have cold water here. But the, the concentration of the fluid, or if you like the dye concentration, that front is, um, moves with the interstitial speed. Because remember the Darcy speed is the, the volume transport velocity and the fluid itself moves between the interstices, between the grains. And so that moves with the speed U upon phi. So that moves a lot more quickly than the um, temperature front because as, as this hot water comes in, what it's doing is the, the, um, it's heating up all the, gray, all the beads in the bead pack at this region here. And all that heat, um, and, and, then, and then what's happening is the, the heat that was in the fluid between here and here has, has now um, disappeared into the beads here. And so the fluid is cold, but it's still the injected fluid. So the injected fluid is not to this point here, but only this part of the injected fluid is still hot because the beads are only hot in this region here. And um, so this region here between the, the strip on the liquid crystal strip and the red, this is actually now cold red fluid and the hot red fluid is only behind that zone there tracking the thermal front. And so what you see here is the, you know, the as we look at time, the thermal front travels more slowly than the fluid front. Can I, and, can I interrupt for a second, Andrew? So yes. an issue of the, is it, there, there's two issues that come to mind. One is the porosity of the, uh, of, of, of the matrix and the other is the relative thermal capacity of the liquid, the water. And the rock, and are they are they the main the principal components of determining uh, this the amount of thermal lag you get? Yeah, so the porosity is very important for this in terms of the and and then of course the specific heat of the water is bigger than the it's about four thousand or uh, four thousand one hundred something, and the specific heat of the rock is typically closer to a thousand, but the density of the rock is higher, so it'll be two two and a half thousand compared to the water. Being about a thousand so that partially compensates so the thermal front typically travels in a, in a real porous rock will travel at about 20 25 percent of the speed of the the fluid but in the bead pack where we have a 40 percent porosity that they're more closely related um so it'll be it'll be 25 maybe up to 30 percent in, in a real rock so the thermal front really lags behind the fluid front um so the you know the 20 percent the, the water in 20 percent of the space is heating up the grain, the eighty percent of the the volume is grains that it's heating up, and so you need to put a lot of water through that zone to heat up the rock or, or cool down the rock, depending on whether you're putting in hot or cold water, and and so that's going to lead to a lot of a difference between the where the injected fluids got to and where the thermal front is. So so typically it'll be a, a factor of one to three, yeah, but it, it depends on the specific heat and the density because um, it's really the heat the, the heat capacity of the rock and the heat capacity of the fluid and obviously the porosity. So, um, yeah, is, is, that, is that okay? Absolutely, yes, thank you, absolutely, yes. So, so, so we have this lag, and so, so but the, the key thing here is that if the fluid we've injected, if this red fluid has a different composition from the fluid in the reservoir, what this, what this means is that the zone between the red front and this front here, the, 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 color, the temperature front, that zone is now fluid with the reservoir temperature, but the composition of the injected fluid and so now we've got three different regions of fluid. We've got injected fluid with the injection temperature, injected fluid with the reservoir temperature, and then reservoir fluid with the reservoir temperature. And these three different fluids may have different densities. And that can lead to some very 
complex flow patterns if we're injecting this into a, a formation. And remember, as I mentioned before, you know, to actually match the composition of the reservoir fluid with the injected fluid is possible, but it may not be something that you do um, by default. And so what we can imagine is if we plot... We have, we have a question for you, Greg, which is yes. a follow-on for my questions. So a fracture basement with a low porosity may have less lag, but has the issue of lateral flow efficiency means the volume of contacted rock is less. Um, so I'm not quite sure. So, so the can you see? So the, if you look in the chat, you'll see the question. I, I've tried to read it out. I think there's a typo. Um, was the issue? The fracture bit with a low porosity may have less lag, but has the issue of lateral flow efficiency. Yeah. So, so the volume of contacted rock uh, will be less if it's going through a fractured rock. But um, in in that case, you may actually be um, losing heat by thermal diffusion. Or thermal conduction into the rock around the fracture and you'll get a growing zone of um, heat loss in that in that in the, in the rock around the fractures which may lead to an effect as i was talking before about the, the enhanced dispersion and it may spread out that temperature front um, so in, in these bead packs we're not seeing any of those effects but um, the, the, the fracture basement um, could lead to quite a lot of thermal dispersion because of the thermal inertia between the rock between the fracture fractures um, so uh, it may, it, it, I think it'll, that, that's going to be very important um, but the um, thermal inertia effect will actually be it depends on whether the rock between the fractures is in thermal equilibrium with the fluid and the fractures or it actually lags behind um, so I think that's you're probably going to get a slightly more complex thermal picture than the things I'm, I'm showing here, but the principles still carry through. Thank you. Um, so so that's, a, that's a very interesting point. And I think there's probably more research to do in that on, to understand that. Um, but uh, but in, in this, in this um, simpler picture with por a, per a porous permeable layer, because the grains are so small, the thermal equilibration time between the fluid and the grains locally is extremely short. And so locally, there'll be an equilibrium. Um, and that, that leads to this um, global uh, mismatch where the thermal front lags the fluid front. And so the effect is, if we, if we look at plotting a, a graph of composition versus temperature, and um, we plot lines of constant density, so these black lines are showing lines of constant density, so you could increase the composition and increase the temperature, and they'd compensate for each other. Um, so there's a series of lines of constant density. Well, if we now imagine that the reservoir has this red, that's the reservoir conditions. And we imagine now injecting, um, and, and there's a series of different fluids we can inject. So if we injected fluid A1 at the same temperature, but with a higher composition, that's going to be denser. And B1 is going to be less dense. But if we inject something with a different temperature, what's, so for example, A3, if we injected fluid that's got a higher composition and a higher temperature, well, fluid A3, when we inject it, is so hot that it's actually less dense than the fluid in the reservoir. But as that fluid moves through the reservoir and its temperature adjusts, it's going to reach the same temperature of the reservoir as the reservoir, but it'll have its original composition. And so in that case, we're going to get a fluid, it's going to go from, from this point to this point. And so the density relative to the, the reservoir is going to change, and that's going to lead to a very different flow pattern. And similarly, we could be injecting cold fluid, for example, B3, and it could be um, very cold, but fresh. And so it could start off being cold enough to be dense and then become less dense with time. So, so what you can see is this thermal inertia can lead to some very interesting dynamics. And um, we've done a series of experiments and I'll, I'll talk through these experiments just to show the different types of flow pattern that can develop. Um, so, so the picture A on, on the left-hand side, this just shows what happens if we inject relatively low concentration, fresh, relatively fresh water, uh, with, with no temperature difference into salt water and this is in a bead pack and what happens is we get a plume rising to the, the top of the layer well and this could be you could imagine this could be a, a, a permeable layer with an incline so there's a component of gravity along the layer and we're going to get a plume migrating like this um, because of the buoyancy difference once the, the source pressure um, has dissipated so you can imagine this sort of flow but if the fluid we inject is hot into cold water and if you want to turn this upside down, we could, we could imagine cold into hot water, um, which would be just sinking rather than rising. But here we've got hot water. Well, what happens now is as this fluid comes in, its temperature is going to adjust. And so at some point beyond the source, it's going to um, cool down and, and 
have the same temperature as the surroundings. And once that happens, it's going to act more like a pressure source and spread in all directions. But the continuing flow is going to drive hot fluid further up. And so what happens is we get a hot plume structure in the center. And you can see this in the third picture um, where we change the color of the dye. And so the fluid comes in, it stays hot, and then eventually it gets cold. And then it spreads out like a source. And we get a moving plume of injected fluid with a very different pattern from the, the, the fresh water we injected. And in fact, this, this um, light stripe you can see here is actually the result of thermal diffusion. Um, so we're actually heating up the, the reservoir fluid near the source, and that's actually rising up just outside the fluid we've injected, causing that little um, structure there. And you can see from that how the fluid spreads out and um, is left behind as the plume keeps on going. Well, what I'm showing on the right-hand side are, are two examples where there's a compositional difference as well as a temperature difference. And um, so in this, this case C, um, we're seeing hot and salty fluid being injected into a cold and fresh system. But the hot, it, it's sufficiently hot that it's actually less dense than the cold and salty system. But as it rises up and cools down, it then comes at the same temperature, but it's still salty. And so it sinks back down and spreads out. And so we get a, an injection plume structure like this. But in, in the case where the, the fluid is injected at the top, hot and salty, so the same problem, if we start from the top and move down, the, the fluid spreads out along the top because it's actually less dense. But as it cools down, it becomes heavy because it's, it's now cold and salty and it sinks to the bottom and spreads on the bottom. And so in both cases, whether we inject at the bottom or the top, we end up having a flow running along the bottom, but we're actually um, developing a, a sort of very different plume type structure. And depending on the geometry of the system, this could be very important in terms of understanding where we're mining the heat from in the, in the geothermal system. Andy, we've got uh, three questions coming, which are uh, not in specific to that slide, but let's let's take them now so that, the, that I have a chance. So Steve Miller asks, have you also considered the effect of induced fractures due to the injection of cold water? So presumably injecting above the frac gradient. Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not going to talk about I'm, I wasn't going to talk about that this evening. But yes, yes. I mean, if you start inducing fractures, uh, well, in fact, I, I, in, in a little bit, I was going to talk about some of the reactions that you may um, induce because of these flows. Um, and if you start inducing fractures, you're going to start then short circuiting because you'll, you'll tend to have the subsequent flow um, running along through those fractures. Um, and that'll where you have the enhanced permeability and you've got to feed back on the flow. Um, but I wasn't, I, I wasn't going to talk about that specifically tonight. But I, I... Okay, Andy, I think your light's gone off. Suddenly you've got darker. Did you know that? Um, yeah, that, that, that's okay. That's, that's all right. I'm in a lab and the... I think okay, lab... all right. I'll ask the two more questions then. So Mohammed Khalid says, uh, do you think fracturing the rock or the formation with fractures is favourable for power generation from geothermal wells because it allows heat transfer by convection rather than conduction? Thus, more power generation is expected. Do you agree with that statement? So, so I think if you're able to access a bigger surface area of the rock, you're going to be, you won't be limit, as limited by thermal conduction to extract the heat from the system. So having, um, you know, a, 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 a more, a broader flow front moving through the system will, will allow you to access more of the thermal energy. Um, so, but, but I think that the converse of that may be that if you, as you flow through the fractures, if, if that leads to um, cooling of the rock, uh, it may, there may be some contraction, you may then open up the fractures and it may lead to short circuiting, um, or so, so, you know, preferential flow um, along those, those fractures. So I think it's, um, I think it needs some um, quite detailed study just to, just to um, check which one of those effects dominates. Okay, uh, I think Greg Waters made a statement there, so I'll go on to Dr. Chris Green. Are the pictures of, plume, of plumes performed in slots? If so, what is the width and the width effect? Oh, that's a very good question. Yes, so these are these are two dimensional cells, in the sense that they're I think they're three or four centimeters thick, and, and we're seeing through the cells, so we can visualize this. But these are the, exactly the same effects as in a three um, D cell. There's no effect from the um, conduction from the side walls into the center of the tank, because these are very, very fast experiments. Um, and so the conduction time of heat through the walls into the center of the tank is much longer than the time for these experiments to occur. So that's, a very, so that's part of the experimental design. The, the reason they're in two dimensional channels is 
for visualization so we can actually see how the flow evolves but um you, you, it, it, these are really going to be three could be three-dimensional effects in a real porous medium and these will be actually symmetric flows but the the flow structures are going to be very similar okay i will actually read out uh, greg walker's comment it's a comment rather than a question just because it's interesting some of our targets i don't know who greg walker works for uh, are fracture basements so we may also get into something equivalent to a reaction infiltration system due to thermal fracturing, which could cause major issues for contacted area. Yeah, so so in fact, that's that, so so you can have reaction uh, um, in, re reactions occurring because of these temperature changes. And in fact, I was just going to sh show some of those. Um, so that can impact the injectivity. So I think there's there's issues about how the fractures themselves change as you change the temperature field through the fractures so you, you can you know, generate the fractures during the injection but then if the temperature changes that may change their permeability but then you may also induce precipitation there may be mixing between the fluids but it may be so, so, so you may have reactions induced by mixing but you can also have reactions induced by changing the temperature and perhaps, perhaps i should show that as the next slide with that okay one, one more question because it's a clarification of what steve has said before i would like to clarify my question I was questioning the effect of temperature change to fracturing of the rock rather than a pressure fracturing of the rock. Well, that was my fault because I said pressure. Um, yeah, so, so yes, short, certainly if you, if you start changing the temperature, you can induce, you, you, the thermal stress can cause fracturing. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I wasn't gonna, I'm not gonna present that today, but um, okay. that, yes, that, that's certainly a, an important effect. Right, let's move on then. Okay, okay. So um, just just as a, a sort of point that if you if you have a, a seal rock along an incline and you inject cold water along the seal rock, again there may be a, a thermal front that lags behind the fluid front. So the fluid you inject may end up actually once it's warmed up to the reservoir temperature, you may get a thermal front where you get a very thin plume running along the boundary from an injector to a, a, a producing well. Um, but the, the cold front is actually cooling down a much bigger zone of the reservoir than, than as the, when the fluid actually coming out. So, um, you know, there's, there's some an important series of calculations to look at in terms of the effects of buoyancy on these flows. But, but to talk about scale and, and um, you know, the, the scale build up in geothermal systems is very important. And particularly if we're looking at um, the sort of reactions where we have temperature changes. So, you know, that there are simple reactions where, where you know, I guess with acid cleaning of wells and so on, but, but also where if we have unsaturated fluid being injected, so if we're injecting fresh water and it heats up in the system, it may be unsaturated and it may then dissolve some of the minerals in the system. Um, and, or, or it may precipitate depending on the solubility, but you can imagine having a depleted zone near the injection well um, in, in a similar way to an acid squeeze, and then the fluid ahead of that is, is at the reservoir temperature. And, and so we get a, a reaction front migrating out from the um, fluid front. And again, there's going to be a separation between the original reservoir fluid that will be here, the injected fluid that's, that's ahead of the reaction front, and then the depleted zone um, of, so this will be injected fluid that's at the injection temperature and composition. Um, so you may again get three zones of flow. And with, with temperature, so if you have reactions induced by temperature, it's possible that when you, you know, if you're injecting cold water into a hot formation, what can happen is the, the cold water may um, migrate to, to a particular point and then heat up and um, the fluid composition um, will change across that thermal front. Um, and um, you, you then may have you know, the rock being depleted in composition. And so with, with a mass balance, you can work out the position of these reaction fronts. So um, we, we've carried out a lot of experiments looking at how reaction fronts migrate through, through a porous layer. So if we take a, a bead pack and we put some, so in our experiments, we put just some, um, a small amount of salt powder in the bead pack, a few percent, and then we inject, we, we saturate it with saturated water and then we inject fresh water and we watch how the reaction front moves through. And again, we find there's a, a reaction front and then there's a fluid front, um, just as we saw with the temperature. And if we measure across the reaction front, we can see a very rapid change in concentration over a centimeter or two as this propagates in the lab. And, and this is now showing you the, the sort of analogous effects that happens um, in, in, in a reacting system to the experiments we just saw a minute ago. So this is, these are, this is an experiment where we inject 
um, in this case, fresh water into a salt saturated pack, but where the pack is um, has a small amount of soluble minerals, it's a salt powder in which is soluble. So when the fresh water comes in, it um, migrates up and it actually dissolves away that salt and then becomes of the same composition and therefore density as the surroundings. Um, and when we continue injecting, um, that continues rising up as a buoyant flow. And what we see is we change the color of the injected liquid and we can see a channel develops, a very localized channel, a dissolution channel through the system. But the fluid we've injected is actually lagging behind and, and is left behind once its density has evolved to the density of the surroundings. Um, this is a, a similar experiment, but in, in this case, the, the fluid actually um, it, it, the, the density change, the fluid becomes denser. And so we get a, we, again, we get a reaction channel um, and migrating through this. And here's, this is the, the reaction front propagating through. But then, then the, the other two experiments I showed before where we had buoyant fluid injected, which, so, so now we have a, a sugar salt system. So we actually have a, a pack full of saturated salt water and some salt powder, but we inject sugar, sugar water, uh, water containing sugar, so which is, has solubility with the salt powder. And when it dissolves the salt powder, the density increases above the density of the salt, salty water. So again, it rises as a buoyant flow. Um, this, this sugary water dissolves the salt, becomes heavy, and then sinks around the outside. You can see this flow pattern. So we're getting a dissolution channel through here, but the fluid driving that dissolution is actually spreading out at this part of the reservoir. So depending on where you're, you're trying to extract from, you can actually get you know, quite specific dissolution channels that may, and then this is a, a similar example, but in this case, the fluid is dense and remains dense. So we have enough sugar in the system that it's dense and, and spreads out. And here's, here's the sort of reaction front moving outwards. So I, I guess the point here is that um, these temperature changes of, or, and, and compositional changes of the injected fluid can drive reactions and they can either be precipitation or dissolution reactions, depending on the solubility. And that can have a big impact in actually changing the, the permeability structure of the porous layer. Um, and, and, and of course, if there is a buoyancy contrast, you know, if it's running laterally along a layer, this is just showing how a reaction front um, can move through through a system. So there's a, I think you can you can perhaps see here, there's a, a change in the color of blue from the blue here to here. And that's the reaction front um, where we have fresh water injected into a pack with salt water and some salt powder. And the fresh water dissolves the salt. At, this is the, where the reaction front is. And this blue zone here is, is now salty water that's basically become salty by dissolving the, the, the salt that was here. And so we get a front moving through. And it's possible to model how this front migrates through the system. We, we've added red just so we can see how the reaction front moves. And this is actually mapping out where that reaction front is. Um, and so it's possible to model that. And I won't go through the, the sums, but we can model how these reaction fronts migrate through the system. And they, they cause a, a, a big impact. Um, I, I see, um, so, so another area of interest is what happens in superheated systems. And in superheated systems, um, so if we're injecting water into a reservoir, but it's now above the boiling temperature, what's going to happen is the water we inject is going to cool down the zone near the injection well, but eventually it's going to reach a, a front where the temperature reaches the boiling point and it's going to boil. But once it boils and produces steam, that steam requires a pressure to actually drive the steam ahead of the liquid front. And so that's, so, so the pressure is going to be, so we're gonna have this, this pressure front here. And if we inject more and more quickly, that pressure at the interface here is gonna be higher and higher. And that's gonna raise the boiling temperature. And surprising that that then has the effect of reducing the amount of boiling we have. And so if you inject into a system where it's boiling and you inject too quickly, you're actually gonna shut off or suppress the boiling and you'll flood the system with hot water. Um, and so there's a sort of optimal rate of boiling so that you don't flood the system too quickly with hot water and you can continue producing steam um, from the system. So in superheated systems, understanding the, um, the, the dynamics of the boiling front is very important. And we, we've actually done a series of experiments to model this. So um, again, this is the diffusion equation for radial injection. And so we have a, a cell where we inject and this is a, a system where we're injecting without boiling and we can just model the thermal front. And I won't go through the sums, but we can model the temperature evolution in time. And, but if we're driving boiling, what happens is we, if we have a temperature pressure plot, and this is the clause, this Clapeyron curve, if we inject cold water at high pressure, 
what happens is as it moves through the formation because of the thermal inertia it heats up to a certain temperature and then once it has that temperature it, uh, the pressure drops towards the boiling front and then the temperature difference between that point there and the temperature of the far field reservoir provides the thermal energy for boiling and that then boils the the, the um, water and then this pressure jump here drives the vapor from the interface to the far field and so if you inject very quickly what happens is this point moves up and it moves up further and further so you have less thermal energy available to drive the, the boiling and if you inject very slowly this point moves down to here and all the superheat of the reservoir becomes available for for boiling and and so you can model both of those limits so again if we solve the equations for the temperature the boiling law with latent heat at the interface and an equation for the pressure of the vapor ahead of the interface and i won't go through these sums we actually get uh, we, we can compare the solutions with our experiments so here's temperature and distance and what we see is we get um, a zone where the water heats up then we get an isothermal zone then we get the boiling and then we have um, the hot, hot steam moving ahead of that and um, if we solve this problem what we find is as a function of the injection rate the fraction that vaporizes drops off and um, that, that sort of depends on um, the porosity and other, other properties too. But basically, if you inject very quickly, you actually end up suppressing the, the injection. But what's very interesting in the system is that if, if the gravity is very important in driving the water, the water tends to spread out along the base of the reservoir. And so it only accesses the thermal energy in the base of the reservoir. And so that means that the, you're only actually um, cooling down the rock in a very narrow zone along the base of the reservoir. The steam produced across this moving front uh, adds to the steam up here, but we're not able to actually access the thermal energy here to boil off the water. So buoyancy can really suppress the access to the hot rock and, and the water coming in from the injection well here spreads out and only and reaches the production well, but it actually in a very narrow current and cools the water or cools the, the reservoir at the base of the system. Um, and so that can actually, so gravity can have a big impact in suppressing the efficiency of boiling. I have to ask the question then, Andy. <clears throat> if you're talking about uh, superheating, what about if you go into the uh, into the critical beyond the critical point? What happens then to the uh, system? Um, well, well, you're always going to have to inject. So you, you mean if you injected the water already super already above the critical point? Well, we, I mean, we're thinking more about carbon dioxide, which is easy to do, but the, the effects, but the logic should be the same. Yeah. Um, the higher thermal capacity, the, the higher heat capacity. Well, you won't get a phase change then, but you'd have to put the energy in before you inject it. I, I mean, I, I mean, for geothermal, you, what you're trying to do is extract the thermal energy from the system. So you'd inject cold water and try to use the latent heat from the rock. You know, you're trying to actually take heat out of the rock. So we, so in this experiment, you know, this is the thermal energy we're accessing to drive the boiling. Um, if we injected um supercritical water before that we'd have already had to put a lot of energy into the water to do that um you're, you're thinking about carbon sequestration are you well no, actually the carbon dioxide has been it's been looked at as 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 the the carrier the carrier fluid so yes sequestration oh, but oh, actually, um, maybe it's too, too well, well, your, comment, your point but but i'm just saying that that it has been looked at seriously as an, yes there's a sequestration sequestration element but actually it's the it's the properties of the supercritical CO2 that, that are uh, in, particularly interesting that, because it's such a very high thermal capacity. That's very interesting. I, I, I'd have to think about that, but I think if you're injecting and you're not actually, ex, you're not using the thermal energy in the, system, in the rock to actually um, source your latent heat of, because what happens is what if you're sourcing that latent heat, that's a very high um, yeah. energy thresh jump. And so you can then access that if you extract the, um, in the, 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 the vapor phase um, from the system. And that's the idea in these superheated systems. So you get a lot higher um, heat recovery. Um, so if you injected supercritical CO2, I think you'd, I think you, yeah, I, I can see that you, because of the phase relation of the CO2 in these, in these systems, you might have to inject it at that condition, but I think that would impact the, um, it would impact the heat recovery compared to the case where you boil it. I, I'd need to have a look at that. Um, that's a very interesting point, though. But let's let's pass it. I'll just check since I've interrupted you. Let's just see the number of messages. I wanted to see um, uh, what issues might you imagine in super hot rock or hot dry rock, Philip? You might have to clarify what you mean by what issues. 
Is there anything in there you can extract? And is that enough information? What issues might you imagine in super hot rock or hot dry rock? Um, so in hot dry rock, uh, I, I think the challenge there is actually, is there any permeability? And, and you know, is it just a fracture that you have, which is going to lead to short circuiting in the system? Um, or, you know, can you create a, enough permeable flow paths that you can access, you have surface area to access the thermal energy? Um, without short circuiting between an injection and production well. Um, okay, I'll let, I mean, I, I think the question was, I wasn't enough there for me to get onto either. So I'll try this one. Cold water injection for completion tests performance at end of drilling operations usually shows the thermal stimulation of existing fractures. Injectivity index often improves with injection time. Some of the permeability improvement is then lost upon heating of reservoir rock. More a comment, but just something somebody's offered yeah no i mean i think there is a lot of experience from obviously injecting in um, water into oil systems um in terms of stimulating the near injector with, with fractures because it's um so um, and that will evolve over time as the thermal front moves okay i think that's everything to uh, raise okay so so should i try crack on yes please Okay, okay, so, so, um, so I, I, you know, there, there has been some um, interest in recent developments in actually looking at closed geothermal systems. So rather than having um, these open systems where you um, pump water through um, the permeable rock um, so that you uh, access a lot of the, the, the thermal energy and then extract that, you, you, know, you have to pump very hard doing that. And, and there's a, a some different schemes where the idea is to put in very long wells and actually drive um, heat recovery by pumping fluid through a well. So um, this, this, these are some cartoons from a, a company called Eva that are developing a, a, a technique of injecting water and extracting it. And um, it, these pipes are very long. And so the water heats up as it goes through this. Um, so this is a, a sort of closed loop system. And this is a very different type of operation from an open system where a lot of the challenge is about how we model the flow through the permeable rock um, and this this is this becomes a, a sort of different problem um, and then and then there's the challenge about um, interseasonal heat storage um, which um, in has relevance for intermittency of renewables but also for um, st storing heat rejection in summer and actually then recovering it in winter and one of the big challenges with interseasonal heat storage in aquifers is actually being able to predict and understand the, the temperature at which you can recover that thermal energy. And so, so the, the, the comments I made earlier on about the effect of thermal dis, about dispersion of the temperature front, particularly in layered or heterogeneous systems where the, the dispersion becomes much larger, is going to be very important in terms of understanding what that thermal recovery curve looks like, because it's not just about recovering the thermal energy, it's about recovering it at temperature as well. And um, so some of the effects we've looked at here are, and if we inject into it, either through a line well or a point source well, as the fluid is injected, if you're injecting, um, and in this case, I'm, I'm showing a, a relatively dense fluid, so it may be different composition from the composition of the water in the aquifer. Um, and so it may spread out under, gravity as well as pressure as it, as it moves into the aquifer. And that can lead to um, a, a more dispersed front um, between the, the hot injected fluid and the fluid in the aquifer. And so um, you know, the, 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 first, oops, the first simple calculation for thermal energy storage is to look at what happens if we have a series of cycles and see if we have a flow that varies in time. So each of these is a year, a summer, winter, summer, winter cycle. And because of this thermal diffusivity or, or dispersivity, so the kappa is that general quantity which could be much enhanced from the molecular value because of the heterogeneity in the rock, um, you can actually see how the temperature front migrates out gradually and the, that, that reduces the fraction of the thermal energy that you inject that you're then recovering because as this grows, you're losing more and more of that thermal energy. But perhaps more um, dramatic than that is that if you have a difference in the density of the fluid because the composition is different, um, then th this is just showing um, a series of cycles. Um, this is the end of an injection cycle and then an extraction cycle in, in a lab experiment, the second injection and third injection cycle. And what we see is that the fluid we're injecting is, is dense relative to the fluid in the system. And um, 
on, on each ex injection cycle, the fluid moves a little bit further into the formation. And on each extraction cycle, we, we remove some of the um, fluid and the, the original reservoir fluid rather than the injected fluid because that keeps on running out um, under gravity because it's dense. And so you end up um, having a less efficient thermal recovery because we're actually recovering original cold fluid from the aquifer rather than the hot fluid we've injected. And you can see with time, you know, so the first few cycles, we're getting 60, 50, 40% of the recovered fluid is actually aquifer fluid rather than um, the, the injected fluid. So the effects of buoyancy can be very important in impacting the efficiency of, of aquifer thermal energy storage. Um, but eventually you're going to heat up the near well site. Um, and if you can heat up the near well site, then, you know, you do have a thermal battery, but that may take you know, many, many years of, of injecting to achieve that. Um, given, given the time, I thought I should perhaps just finish at this point, um, and but I'd be happy to take more questions. So, so I think um, what, what I tried to cover is um, there's lots of opportunities for geothermal power, um, particularly deep geothermal and for power generation where we have very high temperatures. Um, th there's lots of interesting questions about how to, how to model and optimize the way you run superheated systems so that we can optimize the boiling. But there's also a lot of um, concern, a lot of detail that needs to be considered in terms of access to the rock and heterogeneous rocks and making sure that we don't disperse out thermal fronts and actually miss quite bypass quite a lot of the reservoir because of the heterogeneities, because the thermal conduction in the cross flow direction may be quite slow um, on, on the time scale of, of the, these systems. And then I, I suppose the other um, aspects of this are about understanding the, the importance of the fractures and um, sort of having fracture matrix flow, which I haven't, I haven't gone into, and, and the structure of the geology. Um, and then there's a whole series of new challenges emerging with much shallower systems where we're going to store energy in the, the shallow crust. And with, with heat pumps, we might have arrays of boreholes um, where we're going to extract thermal energy, but we may also, also store it in the summer. And again, there's lots of interesting questions there about using the, the shallow surf, subsurface um, for, as a thermal energy store. But in terms of geothermal energy production, there's you know enormous potential, and there's an enormous track record of very um, effective operation. Um, modulo the caveats about scale and precipitation, and also I'm trying to optimize injection strategies to maximize the thermal recovery. So, so I'll finish at that point, and be very happy to take any more questions. Thank you very much, Elliot. It's a, a absolutely brilliant tour de force. I really really appreciate your efforts, and yes. Uh, because of the questions, you couldn't get through all the material. Um, <clears throat> of course, people are asking whether this has been uh, has been recorded, and for everyone's uh, yes, it, we are recording this, uh, so you can replay and uh, listen to what Andy has to say a second time. Um, and so, what I would like to do is uh, open this to uh, general questions. I notice that people are still using the chat box. That's fine, but also because I expect people will get bored of my voice. By all means, if you know how to raise your hand uh, on Zoom, do so. And then we will automatically uh, open the microphone to you so that uh, you can uh, pose your own questions. And until somebody does that, I will carry on asking questions. I see Dr. Chris Green uh, has has put in, put one in the chat box, which I'll ask now, since I don't suppose you can ask it yourself, uh, Dr. Green. Oh, what do you see as the as the issues with some of the shallow hydrocarbon well systems? What do you see as what do you see as the issues? I'm not quite sure what that question is about. So if it's about using hydrocarbon reservoirs as turning them into geothermal reservoirs. I, well, I think that's- Dr. Green, why don't you, why don't you uh, unmute your microphone and ask the question? Oh, yep. Sorry. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, it was, you know, there's a lot of systems that are being proposed now for reuse of uh, old hydrocarbon wells at what I consider a fairly low temperatures. I'm just wondering what do you, conceive as the being the issues with those proposed systems that you've taken a look at so so i well i think there's a, a number of issues but i, th I think um depends how low the temperature is but um uh, if you're producing fluids from those systems you know is it you know what's the non-water fraction of the produced fluid um and are there issues with just in managing that that aspect? I guess there's issues of scale if you're injecting, and the injection water is sort of incompatible with the, the reservoir water. So understanding that in terms of because you don't want to scale up the um, production wells. So there, um, but I think 
you know, in, in principle, there's lots of potential um, because you know these systems are a lot known about how those systems operate, and, and there's a lot of thermal energy in those systems that can be accessed. Um, I think it depends how hot the system is and what you then do with that thermal energy, um, because the the temperature of the produced fluid impacts what you can do with it. So it's not just about the thermal energy you're recovering, it's also the temperature at which you're recovering that. So um, you know, for low grade heating, it doesn't need to be you know, terribly hot. And that has a huge number of potential applications in agriculture and, um, and, and, and for heating systems, distributed heating systems. But if it's for um, power generation, you know, it needs, it, it'll need to be a higher temperature um, pr production. So um, I think, it's, it's matching up the potential heat flow, the temperature of that heat flow in terms of its utility, and then um, what applications there are in the vicinity that where it could actually be um, useful. Um, because it's, you know, this isn't, doesn't have to always be just for power generation. Um, it can be for you know, lo lower grade heating applications. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you Chris. Um, there's a question which uh, Nicholas uh, Urado has asked, which I think many people were considering asking, but I, I'll articulate it in a slightly more neutral way than Nicholas does, which is um, you did you showed the Everloop uh, um, you know conduction system. There are two or three others which are being banded around and uh, getting quite a lot of money and finance for. Um, can you can you give if, if nothing else a qualitative impression about the relative amount of heat extraction you should expect from a closed loop conduction system compared with the the systems you've been modelling more or thoroughly? So, so I think so I think broad I mean broad brush the you know the open the open systems where we're getting uh, flow through the porous layer porous rock or the, or a fractured system we're actually accessing um, in the, the, the fluid is coming in contact with a very large surface area or a very large volume of the rock and you know the thermal conduction is slow so you're um, you know the bigger that area you're then able to access a lot of thermal energy. Um, because the, the pore scale conduction is almost instant on, on the grain scale if it's a, a permeable layer. And if it's a, a pervasively fractured layer, um, you know, you'll, you'll also be able to access a lot of the thermal energy in the blocks between the, in the, in the layers of impermeable rock between the fractures. So I guess the, you know, the advective transport of heat is very effective. Um, and, I, and I guess um, what, you know, what, the, the, what you're doing there, though, is you're actually having to pump the water through and do pressure work because the you know you're going through a low permeability system and so that needs um, mechanical work to drive the, the fluids through um un unless you're just going to let so i guess in a superheated system you could let the system run down but as the pressure drops um you know that, that you you ultimately have to recharge the system so um and i guess some of these loop systems obviously you've got um you know a pipe which has less uh, you know, less resistance to flow so that that's that that conflicts that's that contrasts but obviously the surface area through which you're conducting is just the surface area of the pipe um so you know so, so i think they're very different systems um and um you know i think it'll be it'll be very interesting seeing what sort of data emerges from these these, these closed loop systems yeah <clears throat> i think i think mathematically in one case you're you're looking at uh, conduction as the as the sole uh, means, or albeit you can you get uh, convection when it comes to recirculating the fluids. In other words, you've got uh, advection, convection, and conduction as a way of har harvesting the uh, the heat energy from the formation over a much wider uh, uh, surface area. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think the, you know, the, I, I suppose you don't get the issues of scale and, and, and precipitation that I've, I've been talking about in the natural system. Um, if you're sort of not not going through the natural system, but so, so I think I think they're very different. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, another question, which I also uh, Susan Fellows made, and I, I again, it must be on many people's lips. Can you can you uh, after this uh, meeting uh, uh, send me an email with the uh, with the, your the references, the academic references that you've you've uh, written, um, so we can all study the the, the relevant papers on this. Um, sure. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. 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 Okay, uh, let me just see who else has uh, picked up something. Do please don't wait, don't wait for me to uh, invite you. If you've got if you've got questions, just open your microphone and, uh, and and ask them. You know there aren't enough people here to make that chaotic. You can you can simply ask a question rather than writing a chat for me to read. Yes, Peter, go ahead. You've got your, yeah. 
you should, Peter, you need to unmute. And now you can ask a question. You need to unmute, Peter, since you put your hand up. I don't think Peter is able to unmute. Does anybody else want to ask a question? You don't, you don't need to put your hand up. There are not enough people here to worry about people talking over each other. Does anybody have, yeah? Anyone want to ask a question? Yes, can I ask? Go ahead. Uh, this is Sadar from Turkey. I just would like to check with you. Do you know any software, simulation software that uh, accurately simulates the heat flow inside the reservoir that we can use it to, to model and simulate the hot rock reservoirs or the, the, the geothermal reservoirs? Um, so, so I don't really, I mean, I, I guess as you've seen from the talk, I mean, I, I'm doing um, slightly simpler problems, trying to understand some of the, the controls on the heat recovery. And um, so, I mean, there are, there are I, I'm sure there are um, codes that exist, but I, I, don't, I'm not, I don't really use them. So I, I'm not really in a position to um, direct you to a particular code. Okay, uh, <clears throat> Susan Fellows is uh, trying to uh, suggest CMG to you. CMG stars, stars is of course used for um, uh, uh, water flood, uh, heat floods, etc., and, and heat stimulation. Um, okay, so uh, another point, yes, for you. Another answer you've got there in the. Have a look at the chat for your answers, uh, because there's several people coming up with ideas. Um, I also would put in darts as well, which hasn't been mentioned there. Um, does anybody else want to ask um, a question? Uh, I, I have, may, may, uh, uh, Adam, it sounds like one of the uh, people couldn't, couldn't uh, unmute themselves. So maybe you need to help allow everybody to unmute. That was Peter, could not unmute. So Adam, if you can help everybody unmute, Peter could try again and others can try. Yeah, Timothy, I have a question. John DeWart here from the yeah, United States. My question, Andy, is what uh, experiments are you planning to do next? What are you looking at in your next stages? Um, so, well, well, so there's a, so, so we're, I mean, we've got very interested in um, sort of interseasonal heat storage um, in, in systems and trying to understand in more detail some of the effects of the um, dispersion and also the heat loss to the um, surrounding impermeable the, the seal above and below an aquifer to see um, to, to try and get a handle on the temperature of the recovered water and the controls on that in terms of the efficiency of the system. So and, and then what we can do to try and upgrade that efficiency. So um, so it's really trying to understand the, the different effects of dispersion and how they impact or how we can circumvent them in some sense to. Um, make aquifer thermal storage more efficient. So that's one one area we're doing a lot of work on. Um, and then I, I guess just in the the straight geothermal, we're we're still very interested in understanding um, the effect of some of these you know the complex rock structures in terms of access to the thermal energy. And again, what we can do to try and access more of that thermal energy. So I think there's lots of interesting techniques that have been used in um, enhanced oil recovery for accessing um, different parts of the reservoir that are harder to, to reach. And I think um, one of the questions is how, you know, how effectively can we um, adopt or adapt some of those effects to, to, to make you know, the geothermal recovery um, to, to increase the efficiency of that recovery, but, but within a very different cost structure, I guess. Okay, anyone else want to ask a question? Peter, you should be able to unmute now. We've uh, we've corrected that. Anyone else want to? Uh... It, it was always available. I've sent Peter an unmute request, but okay. I will click the button now. If it appears that I'm requesting to unmute, it should work. If not, it's not on our side, sadly. Okay, anyone else want, whilst Peter is working out uh, whether he can unmute or not, does anybody else want to ask a question? Any other comment, does, or even just a comment, uh, a reaction to what you've heard? Um, what it means in terms of uh, the chances of uh, geothermal becoming a, a major source of energy by 2050. Anything you want to comment or ask? We're in the last few minutes of this, so we can we can open this up to more tangential geopolitical issues if you wish. And John DeWart here again. I think one of the big unknowns for closed loop and even the, the open systems through the fractures is the rate of heat coming back through the rock, so the conductive heat. 
So the rock is actually going to get cooled down. And at what point do the systems come to equilibrium? And therefore, at what temperature are they at equilibrium? I think that's a bit of an unknown. Agreed. Uh, Greg Walker here from Repsol. We're having an internal discussion, the difference between CO2 neutral and renewable. If we produce the help rock once, you have that CO2 neutral, but we'd rather be in the business for renewable, where it's a case of what is that steady state we can maintain such that it's producing in 50 years time. I think I think John that the uh, that the that the mathematics of uh, oh hold on I'm just going to let somebody in the, the, of of the conduct of the conduction solution um, uh, they're, they're, they're quite if you go if you look at the the research papers they're, they're quite well worked out and there are serious concerns about uh, about whether it is sustainable in the in the medium term um, but you know we, it looks like we're not we're not going to be looking at the mathematical derivations of that today but they I can assure you they're in the literature. Uh, if you want to make reference to them. Any other remarks or comments? Um, I, I'm happy to uh, to keep Randy for a few more minutes. Does anybody else want or make or make a broader remark? Does anybody want to make a remark uh, which looks at a vision for what uh, we should be doing with geothermal? Maybe that would guide Andy in the way he uh, considers his um, his next research proposals. Hi, Timothy, it's uh, Christopher Green again. Um, yeah. You know, one of the questions I've raised with a lot of people for geothermal is a frat guy. You know, one of the big things we look for is heat, heating up the fluids afterwards in conventional fracks. And sometimes that takes months. You know, the notoriously good insulators, rocks, and trying to get anything from just conduction and temperature transfer has been an issue. You know, when we try to rock the well and get convection set up and, you know, try and work on any you know, in, in some of these geothermal, it could be radiation, but, you know, I, I struggle with just this conduction type model. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, so I suppose what I've been talking about mainly is advection, where you're, you're flowing through and you've got sufficiently, well, it's either, it's either permeable and porous or it's the fractures are sufficiently pervasive that you can access the thermal energy in the, in the formation. And I think that's, um, you know, that advective system, um, is, is, I guess, what I was mainly focusing on today. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, that's field proven. I might, you know, typically if we have heat, some kind of transfer, temperature and well bore, that works. And we know there's limited opportunity for that. But as people are mentioning these other opportunities that they're chasing, like I say, it'll be interesting, the research, but I, I struggle with some of the physics. Yeah, Chris, you're not alone in that, but I also would like to move on from uh, that. Maybe I shouldn't have raised it so emphatically to start with. Um, just looking at other things. So, so Andy, as you see, I, I'm, I'm particularly passionate about uh, what you can do uh, super uh, with, with supercritical fluids because of the higher uh, 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 thermal capacities and other, and other features, of course. I mean, is that, can we tempt you to look at that uh, with your- no, I, th I, think, I think that's a very interesting problem. I'll, I, I certainly will um, sort of go and have a look at that because I think that's, I mean, changing the fluid phase and understanding how that impacts the flow. The flow. Um, I mean, I, I guess in these systems, they'll have water as the um, original host fluid, and then it's looking at how the CO2 migrates through that and acts as, as a sort of heat, heat transfer. Um, I mean, I've looked at some of the heat transfer effects for CCS itself, where, you know, as you're injecting CO2 for CO2 storage, you, you generate you can generate depending on the temperature of the input you may actually generate a, a cold zone it may be cold when it comes in you may actually generate a cold zone around the injection well um, and then the co2 warms up and that can change the viscosity and the density of the co2 substantially yeah. and so it may well be that near the injection well in co2 projects and it depends on the, the properties inside the injection well and and what you know what what your surface pressures are but it may well be that near the injection well the co2 current is actually quite a bit because it's more viscous it may actually be quite a lot deeper and so it may be able to overcome capillary thresholds into into layers above whereas further away that may not be the case and so you, you can actually get sort of thermally induced um flow patterns of the co2 plumes 
which um, is, is sort of quite an interesting effect. But I didn't look at that in the context of then recovering the CO2 for heat recovery. So yeah, so I, th I think there's some interesting questions there. I'll, I'll have a look at that. Yes. It, I, yeah, I mean, I mean there's a, if there's a paper or two outlining some of the concepts, it'd be very interesting to see that. I'm going to put you in touch with a couple of guys after this, after, when, when we're offline, um, who, are, who are looking at this now. They're, they're also looking at some extraordinary things you can do with the, uh, um, with, with, with CO2 and rather than moving uh, uh, hot fluids out the well bore, whether you can do anything uh, in situ. But we'll, mm. we can move, move on to that another time. Actually, John Mike mentioned it. Um, we have uh, come to half past six. And although I'm conscious that there are a number of issues we could continue talking about, Andy, I would, I would like to, on behalf of our audience, thank you enormously uh, for sharing your time uh, and the analysis that you've done. Um, it's been really riveting and I'm, I'm very pleased and uh, you've put so many things in perspective for me, certainly, uh, that I hadn't really managed to uh, capture in my mind before uh, about all the, the, the competing issues uh, related to what looks like quite a simple process on the surface. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, for everybody else, I think um, uh, probably we ought to have a, a bit of a comfort break. Um, I propose to restrict that to 20 minutes, um, which means that we'd reconvene at uh, 1850. The other thing I'd say for those of you who don't want a comfort break, unmute your microphones, please, and network remotely. Just just throw out points and, and comments and start talking. I'm, we have we have had an emphatic rejection of attempting to meet physically at Imperial College, for example, although that's of course only for people based in the UK. Um, but I do want to try and see whether I can find another way to encourage people to to network and get to know each other. Uh, in the in the in this this virtual environment. Anyway, I'm going to sign off for 20 minutes and have a comfort break myself, and then uh, I will be back again a, a few minutes before uh, 10 to uh, 7 UK time. That's uh, UTC zero. Um, and when uh, John John Clegg will uh, give his presentation again, Andy, thank you very much indeed.
Ja. Ja, Kusta. Um, well, the talk's ended at the moment. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if ever there's some other time. No, I'm not with a baby. I'm just saying, we're going to go off. Well, I'm going to go off. Um,
I agree. Right. Long, long time. Yeah, more than that, I think. Yeah. I, by the way, I've changed my, um, I've disabled all my Zoom and stuff. Uh, sometimes Yeah, I've actually, I've actually left it. So how are you, how are you? You know, you're still in that job. You've been there a long time. Yeah. 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 Can you hear me now? Oh, sorry. Um, so we have only one resume for a geoscientist. So really? Unless, I mean, I, I look, it, are they on the same folder, all of them? Yeah, no, uh, yes. I looked uh, yesterday again, and I've seen only one. Uh, I'll contact Ryan again and ask uh, if he has some somewhere else. Yeah, I, I wanted to talk to Rob about it. I mean, he he's a master student, which is good, but uh, his Laura, resume sounds... your mic is open, Laura. Sorry. We can all hear you, Laura.
John, can you uh, come off mute so I can see you? I, I am off mute and hopefully you can see me as well. I certainly can. And uh, perhaps you could, perhaps you could uh, see if you can upload your first presentation slide. Let me see if I could do that. <clears throat> hopefully you can see a slide. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, John. Brilliant. John, okay, I'm going to, uh, well, I'll give it a minute because I think some, I did say that we start uh, at 10 so it's just before that. And I'll just check there's no... Um, yeah, no problem. Uh, Interesting from, from Greg Walker. Did you read that? <clears throat> if working volcanics, remember to look for helium. If ITER is a success and we still don't have liquid nitrogen superconductors, then we would need more helium. It's interesting, Greg. Are you actually here, Greg, since we've got one minute? It's looking at, uh, I mean, how much helium there is um, near to volcanics compared with how much helium there is already in, uh, in, uh, in with big oil and gas fields or gas fields especially. And you look around the world, if you look into East Siberia, north part of East Siberia, some of the fields there have got 15% helium and they are uh, trillions of cubic meters. And so it's more about getting bringing the helium to market uh, than there being uh, not, in, not sufficient helium to, um, uh, to, to power all that fusion. Um, so but are you not talking to us, uh, Greg? Where have you gone? Maybe you're not here. Maybe you've gone. Um, OK, I digress. So, John, uh, your talk, geothermal well construction at scale, challenges and opportunities. The introduction and development of novel well construction techniques transformed the unconventional oil and gas industry in the last two decades. The opportunity exists to transfer, transfer these techniques to an emerging unconventional geothermal industry. Challenges exist, not least in the form of high temperatures and difficult formations. But challenges lead to opportunities, and this talk explores how oil and gas might be able to apply some of its skills and experience to geothermal to the benefit of both industries. John Clegg has spent more than three decades introducing new technologies for well construction in the oil and gas industry, working for companies such as Schlumberger, NOV, Ultraterra and Weatherford, and always operating at the junction of market needs and emerging technical capabilities. He is now dividing his time between writing, consulting, and building a new company, probably pronounced Hefi Energy, but I will be corrected on that, where he works as its chief technology officer. John is also active in SBE and is chair of the upstream oil and gas committee for IMECI, Institution of Mechanical Engineers UK. John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tim, and uh, hello, everybody. Just sound check, Tim. Am I coming through clearly? Can you hear me? Good, good. Okay. So uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, it, it's really nice to be able to wear multiple hats. Uh, and um, as Tim said, I'm kind of dividing my time between two passions of mine at the moment, one of which is uh, drilling technology and uh, seeing the migration, potential migration of drilling technology from oil and gas into geothermal. And the other one is innovation and the creation of value, which can be, but doesn't have to be uh, through, uh, through technology. And uh, you can see there's two websites on the uh, slide here, and those websites kind of define those two, um, uh, the, the two interests that, that, that I have, if you like. So I'm going to talk about technologies and their applications uh, through the talk. So I thought I'd start, maybe just break the ice, loosen things up a bit, um, by talking about some interesting historical uh, technological um, developments which have relevance to uh, geothermal. And uh, hopefully I'll explain why as I go through it. And uh, let's see if I can advance this slide. Yep. Um, I'm gonna start by talking about telephones, uh, probably to many people's surprise. But 146 years ago this month in February, 1876, a lawyer representing a guy called uh, Alicia Gray filed a patent caveat uh, at the US Patent Office for a telephone. A patent caveat has disappeared uh, from, the, um, from the patent landscape, but it's been replaced recently by something very similar, which is a provisional patent application. It's like a patent application without claims. And that was on the 14th of February, 1876, which is the same day that Alexander Graham Bell's lawyer filed a patent application at the same office for a similar device. And um, things removed remarkably quickly in those days, because only three weeks later, Bell's patent was granted. Imagine getting a patent granted in three weeks these days. 
And of course, history's got him down as the inventor. Um, but it was kind of unusual and intriguing that two people should file a patent for the same item on the same day. And about 100 years ago in 1922, there was a, a couple called William Ogden and Dorothy Thomas. They produced an article in a journal called Political Science Quarterly where they found 148 cases of apparently independent simultaneous scientific discoveries or inventions. Um, in 1611, sunspots were discovered by Galileo, Fabricius, Shiner, and Harriet, all in the same year. And in 1850, centrifugal pumps were invented by Apold, Gwynne, and Bessemer, all apparently independently. And you wouldn't really expect that to happen randomly, but it actually happens quite a lot. And if you study innovation, it's kind of interesting to figure out, well, why does, why does in simultaneous invention happen so much? And the reason is that after a long time of dormancy, these new ideas emerge from apparently unrelated sources. And I think that's happening at the moment to an extent in geothermal energy, especially with some of the, the new unconventional geothermal systems that I'll talk about. Uh, but it's also important for those ideas to emerge at the right time. And I'll stick with the telephone theme for a moment. And I found this on the internet and I had to do a lot of searching before I convinced myself it was real. And uh, it was syndicated through a lot of different newspapers, but this does actually appear to have been in the Boston Globe in 1953. Um, president of uh, one of the um, sort of US telephone companies, a guy called Mark Sullivan saying, one day, you'll be able to carry a telephone around. It won't be connected to the wall by a wire. It might be like a watch. It might not have a dial. Users might be able to see each other if they want as they talk, and it might even translate from one language to another. He's, he's just described the smartphone that I carry around with me every day. And uh, this was um, nearly 60 years ago. Um, but of course it didn't happen 60 years ago. And the reason why it didn't happen 60 years ago is because there was a lot of technology that you need to create a smartphone, you know, miniature cameras, high resolution screens, uh, miniaturized electronics, battery technology, uh, APIs. Um, interestingly, cellular network was already available in 1953. It just wasn't used very much. But the point is that unless ideas come out at the right time, they, they're kind of useless. And about 12 years ago, a guy called Stephen Johnson wrote a book, Where Good Ideas Come From, and he talked about the context of what he called the adjacent possible, where there's always new layers of scientific discovery and innovation that are just around the corner. And you discover them one at a time, like peeling back the layers of an onion. And as you reveal the next layer, new technologies and new inventions become possible. But of course, until you peel back that layer, they're not possible. So timing is everything. Uh, that's why the smartphone wasn't uh, developed and marketed in uh, 1953. And that's also why technologies tend to emerge at the same time as each other, because these possible technologies, enabling technologies emerge and, uh, and mean that it can all happen. So one lesson from what Stephen Johnson wrote and what these other guys discovered is don't listen to people who say, oh, we tried that before 10 years ago. We tried it 20 years ago. And I think those arguments are particularly relevant to some of the things we're trying to do at the moment to scale geothermal energy. There are things that may not have worked 10 years ago if you tried them then, but might work now if you try them now. And, I, I, and hopefully I'll explain over the course of the next hour or so uh, what I mean by some of that. One final bit of technology before we move into uh, drilling and geothermal is, um, is bicycles. Um, so I guess I'm gonna say cycles um, because they had one, two, or even three wheels where uh, they started to appear in the early 19th century. And there were lots of different designs and you can see a couple of designs here that um, were done for very good reasons, but weren't necessarily uh, successful. Um, but it took about 70 years, but after about 70 years of bicycle production, the industry settled on the bicycles that we see today. They have a diamond frame, they have rear wheel drive, they normally have gears, front wheel steering, two wheels, and you know you might get hybrids, racing bikes, mountain bikes, but they all follow the same kind of uh, basic topology. They don't look as different as these guys did. Um, and I think that's kind of the stage we're at with some of the uh, new ideas for um, unconventional geothermal wells at the moment. There are lots of different ideas around. Some of them might succeed, some of them might not, but everything at the moment is being done in good faith and for very good reasons. There were very good reasons behind the designs of the two bicycles that you can see on the screen today. Um, I suspect one of the things, and we'll get into this a bit later, one of the things that's gonna determine which uh, 
geothermal applications are successful is the laws of physics. And that was probably something that did for these guys as well. I mean, you know, the law of gravity, for example, is going to work against you if you try and stop quickly on the uh, penny farthing uh, on the left. So keep these concepts in mind as we discuss innovation in the context of geothermal. And I'm going to move now into talking about oil and gas. And everyone thought George Mitchell was crazy when he started to experiment with the extraction of gas from the Barnett Shale. Um, trying to get gas from source rock rather than from more conventional reservoirs like sandstone or limestone reservoirs. Um, but using a combination of horizontal drilling and fracking, he was able to get gas from places where people didn't believe it could be economically extracted. Um, I was uh, fortunate enough to live and work in Fort Worth, Texas, um, about a little over 10 years ago. And I actually took this photograph from my office window and uh, at the time, if you drove around Fort Worth, it was not at all unusual to see uh, drilling rigs uh, next to freeways, as uh, was the case of this one, um, adjacent to uh, residential housing estates, uh, you know, close to uh, retail centers or industrial sites. Uh, there were rigs everywhere uh, drilling the barnet uh, for, um, for, for gas. And what made it possible was a combination of two new technologies horizontal drill, well, the new technology of horizontal drilling and maybe the slightly more mature technology of uh, hydraulic fracturing, but bringing those technologies together changed the game and allowed the exploitation of unconventional resources in the uh, United States. And before horizontal drilling was made possible in other markets and other parts of the world, um, unconventional boom probably wouldn't have been able to happen. So again, it's about, it's about timing of having technologies available at the right time. And um, there have been remarkable increases in productivity and remarkable reductions in the cost of drilling unconventional wells uh, since uh, the early part of this century when, uh, when, when people started, when uh, George Mitchell was looking at his first wells. And you see significant improvements uh, in um, sort of first month uh, production, and uh, there are equivalently uh, dramatic and uh, impressive uh, reductions in the, uh, the, the cost of drilling sections. So was unconventional drilling a big success? Well, to answer the question on the screen, how much money's been made from uh, shale? If you read this book, which is a really good book, uh, the author was co-author of uh, The Smartest Guys in the Room, The Enron Story. Um, the answer is, well, actually none. Um, and what the author argues is that it wasn't cash flow that drove the shale boom. It was all about investment capital. and um, it could be argued that a lot of people made a lot of money from it and an equivalent number of people lost an equivalent amount of money uh, and that the overall um, profit from uh, shale uh, was um, probably about the same as the cumulative profit from the airline industry over the last hundred or so years, which is about zero. Uh, there's been as much lost as there has, uh, has been made. Now, there are other reasons uh, for drilling for shale, uh, for, for oil and gas from shale. Um, there's some geopolitical reasons which are particularly relevant um, as we all keep a half an eye on the news and what's going on in Europe at the moment. Um, but perhaps um, for um, geothermal and for unconventional geothermal development, we'd like a business model which is a bit more sustainable and economics which are a bit more sustainable than, um, than was maybe the case for some of the uh, unconventional oil and gas developments. So, what do horizontal drilling and uh, hydraulic fracturing have to do with geothermal? Well, potentially quite a lot. And I'm gonna explain now what I mean by unconventional geothermal. And uh, Andy showed some of these systems uh, in his talk earlier, and you might even recognize some of the uh, images. Uh, so this is an enhanced geothermal system. Uh, this is a system that could be drilled in hot, dry rock where there is no natural uh, fracture system which has uh, water in it, hot water in it that you can uh, that you can mine or extract. Uh, and so you drill a couple of wells, uh, not necessarily vertical wells, um, which effectively you could call an injector and a producer. You frack between them, you flow through the uh, artificial fractures, and uh, the fluid picks up heat as it goes in this image from left to right, and uh, you return hot fluid to the surface, and then you can generate electricity or you can create heat from, uh, from that. It basically creates its own permeability. There's also uh, a whole 
host of different advanced geothermal systems. And these are basically closed loop systems where the working fluid doesn't have to come into contact with the uh, formation. These could be completely cased or completely lined. And they might never, the, the, the working fluid that goes around the cycle and through the power station might never actually see the rock that it's picking up uh, heat from. And there was a, um, Andy talked briefly about um, the one of these systems from uh, uh, EVA. And the image on the left is cartoony, kind of similar to uh, EVA's concept. Um, you see there are many other ways of doing it. Uh, and there are, um, if you like, um, single well systems, which where you, where you, where you have a, um, a well that's kind of a U shape or um, a V shape or something uh, returns to the surface. And also uh, coaxial systems in a single well where you might uh, flow down the uh, inside of a piece of insulated pipe and have the return uh, up the outside. Uh, pros and cons um, for uh, both sets of systems. As we, uh, uh, and there is also the potential for hybrids where you could have a closed loop system which is whose performance is enhanced by uh, the uh, leveraging uh, existing um, natural fractures or by uh, creating uh, artificial uh, fractures. Um, and as with the case of the bicycles, lots of different ideas, lots of good ideas. They've all been done for very good, very well thought out reasons. And we don't know yet which one of them is gonna prevail, uh, but probably one or two will. And what's occurred to me looking at them is that whichever ones prevail are gonna need a fairly sophisticated level of well construction. Um, none of these systems is gonna work very well just by punching holes in the ground and hoping that we find some heat. Um, we're probably gonna need things like directional drilling, measurements, in some cases, uh, hydraulic stimulation or, uh, or fracking. Um, and it's likely to be the most economically viable systems that, uh, that are gonna prevail. And one of our missions, I think, when we're thinking about drilling and measurements and well construction, which is my interest, is to make sure that we minimize the cost and maximize the uh, productivity as much as we can through the well construction uh, process. Um, I think, and others ag agree, you can, you can find a number of uh, articles in the literature that agree that longer laterals uh, in oil and gas tend to lead to a larger exposure of hydrocarbons. And because of heat transfer, longer laterals, and, and we heard from Andy earlier in response to one of the questions about uh, the uh, economics of uh, closed loop systems, a larger surface area to get heat from the formation into the uh, fluid uh, is going to favor more exposure at high temperature. And uh, that is likely to lead to uh, horizontal wells. Why horizontal wells? Because however hard you try, I think there are gonna be limitations, temperature limitations of drilling, measurement, completions, production equipment that you put into the well. And so that if you have anything other than just a blind well punched into the ground, that's gonna put a, a lower limit in terms of depth on what you can do because temperature increases with depth. Uh, as a result of the thermal gradient. Um, once you've established that, if you have a, a lot of wellbore which is exposed to the uh, formation, uh, you want to have it exposed to formation which is as uh, high temperature as possible. So that means that a lateral is likely to be favored over a vertical well simply because the, the, the net heat you're gonna get from the same length of well is, uh, is, is gonna be greater. And I think that's what the authors of this particular reference we're getting at. And we're getting much better at drilling horizontal wells uh, in oil and gas. Um, in Steve, Steve Rassifos wrote an article uh, just this month in JPT, um, and he quoted Reistad, 2014, 300 rigs uh, drilled uh, 20 million feet, less than 20 million feet of laterals. Seven years later, fewer rigs drilled more than double that footage. So we've got much, much better and much, much faster and of course, fast uh, generally means cheap uh, in terms of, uh, of, of drilling wells. And interestingly, a lot of people are drilling sort of three mile, 15,000 foot uh, laterals as opposed to the 10,000 foot laterals that we previously saw because they are seen, I think partly for reasons analogous to what I described on the previous slide, they seem to be uh, more capital efficient and uh, provide uh, better returns on investment. 
But uh, we do have, uh, of course, we like to impose artificial restrictions on ourselves. And uh, lease lines quite often uh, dictate that you can't drill anything more than a, a, a two mile lateral. We thought it would be useful to see, are we in the right ballpark in terms of how much energy we can extract from a uh, geothermal well compared with an unconventional US land well? So um, if you run the numbers, unconventional US wells will produce uh, in their lifetime between half a million, three quarters of a million barrels. Um, and that's equivalent to approximately a thousand gigawatt hours uh, from a well. Um, there's a lot of literature that suggests that AGS and EGS wells can deliver in the region of eight megawatts per well. Sometimes it's higher and sometimes it's lower. Um, and what that means is that it will take 16 years for a geothermal well to produce the same amount of energy as an unconventional oil and gas well, but the geothermal well could produce for a lot longer, decades more potentially. It's, it, it may not decline, I'll come back to this in a minute, but it may not decline in the same way as the uh, oil or the gas well does. And that longer time scale from an economic perspective is a bit of a blessing and a bit of a curse. It's great that you can produce for so long, but how many people want to invest in something which is not going to pay back for uh, like uh, sort of 20, 30 years. Um, not many. I mean, people want to get uh, rapid return on investments, and that could be a potential uh, barrier. Um, the questions are, can we actually get eight megawatts from a single well? And the question that I guess comes more to what I'm interested in is, can we actually drill that well for $5 million? Or is, is it going to cost us $50 million, or can we do it for cheaper than a, a, an unconventional oil and gas well? So that leads to a question of how complex does the well need to be? And in order to answer that, it's worth thinking about some of the drivers for what is going to potentially cause us problems. I mean, we had a couple of questions and a few comments in Andy's lecture about what are the issues with um, the thermal performance of uh, closed loop geothermal wells and uh, enhanced geothermal systems. Um, I'm not a reservoir expert and I'm not a thermal expert. I'm here to talk about drilling, which I'll do in a minute. But I thought it'd be useful just to touch on these uh, as long as you're kind with the questions and recognize that this I'm, I'm getting slightly out of my area of expertise. But um, there are potentially issues in the uh, vertical. Uh, I borrowed this from a website of a company called Icarus Energy. Um, and um, their argument here is that um, in, the, um, in the vertical, what we have to do is to provide as much thermal insulation as possible between the well and the formation, particularly because you're likely to pass through aquifers before you get the heat back to the surface. And they'll be delighted to take all the heat from you before it gets to surface. Uh, and so that means uh, maybe thinking differently about uh, cement, where you place it, how you use it, and also the properties of it. And uh, so some kind of thermal insulation around the, uh, the, the OD of the well. In the lateral, we've got the opposite problem. Uh, if we do use uh, cement, we don't want it to be um, uh, thermally, uh, sort of thermally insulating. So the cement then has to have a high thermal conductivity uh, in order to be able to get uh, heat from the, uh, the, the formation and uh, into the well. And neither of those problems appears to be insurmountable. Uh, they, you know, the, there's application, there's material science, there's gonna be a lot of engineering, but it should be possible to build wells where we've got high thermal conductivity in the lateral and lower thermal conductivity in the vertical. Um, then it gets a bit more tricky. Um, this is um, a, as you can see, I'm not gonna read all of this out. You, you can see from the font and the quality of the uh, reproduction that this uh, document was produced a few years ago. Uh, this actually talks about the hot dry rock geothermal work that was done. I think Andy referred to it at the beginning of his talk in, uh, in Cornwall in the uh, 1980s. And um, these guys saw what you might expect, which is a uh, decline uh, in performance uh, uh, temperature performance over a uh, production period when we're taking heat out of a uh, hot dry rock well. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, unfortunately, rock doesn't have very good thermal conductivity. It was explained to me uh, a year or so ago by uh, a friend of mine 
who said, the thermal conductivity of rock varies between rocks, that the kind of rocks we're gonna be drilling here by a factor of two. Uh, so it's either bad or it's really bad, like doubly bad. Um, that there is no highly thermally conductive rock. And what happens is if you imagine, you've got this set of concentric rings here, if you imagine the central one is the borehole and you're pulling heat out of the rock in the borehole, uh, rock from, uh, so heat from radioactive decay in the adjacent formation or from the center of the earth or from wherever is trying to get back into that borehole, of course, to balance things and to replenish it. But the closer you get to the borehole, the smaller the uh, cross-section area it has to flow through. So it finds it harder and harder as you get uh, closer and closer. Um, these guys, I recommend you take a look at this paper because they will explain it a lot better than I do. Uh, but they recognize this and their recommended solution is what they call a thermal soak method where you drill a number of wells and you produce from them uh, individually. So um, this particular case, uh, they're flowing through well S, which is in the center of this image. They're taking heat from the formation around it. And you can see that uh, the, there's not that much heat flow. It's getting kind of depleted. But there are two adjacent wells, uh, well R and well T, which are where the, uh, the, the formation is um, effectively being reheated. And the fluid in the well bore, which is not flowing, is also being reheated as the, uh, the, the temperature in the formation uh, recovers. Uh, they have uh, solutions where they propose effectively a, uh, a set of laterals that looks a bit like this, uh, where you're producing heat from the, uh, fr from the red one and where you are allowing the blue ones to uh, recover. And it, it's likely that the number is not going to be three. Um, I think they've modeled, I think they've got a good idea of how many wells you'll need, but they, for understandable reasons, they haven't published that yet. Um, but this drives us towards uh, not only horizontal wells, but also multilaterals. And also because you're trying to manage flow of heat into each of the individual wells while another one is producing, it also starts to uh, set constraints over how close together you drill them, uh, sort of the, the, the spacing between them. Uh, their relative positions and so on. If you project back from this into the EGS systems where you frack between uh, wells earlier on, if you're fracking between wells in order to create a flow path, you're also going to want to have a good idea of how close they are together. If they're too close together, then you're not going to get enough uh, surface area in the uh, fractures. If they're too far apart, then the fractures uh, might miss or only partially hit the target well. And so th there's going to be an optimum position and so what I'm suggesting is that for many of the solutions we're looking at, and some of it was explicit in those images I showed you earlier, and some of it more implicit, uh, there's going to be a requirement to draw wells that maybe look a bit like our oil and gas wells that we draw for uh, unconventionals, where you have uh, sets of laterals, and they could be parallel laterals. Uh, they might be uh, multilaterals, where if you point them you know, north, south, east, west, and points of the compass, you get better heat recovery. Um, but you could finish up with wells that look very much like the wells that we drill in unconventional oil and gas. And if they do look like this, it's kind of good news because uh, it means that uh, drilling the same well over and over again, as we discovered in the US, means that you can dramatically reduce the cost of uh, drilling these wells. So factory drilling or cookie cutter drilling, whatever you want to call it, uh, by drilling every well pretty much the same, you could take huge amounts out of the uh, cost over um, over years as you uh, as you learn how to do it and as you uh, optimize uh, performance. And I'll come back and talk a bit more about optimization uh, later on. What that means is that, and kind of as Tim alluded to in his introduction, there is a tremendous amount of opportunity for oil and gas companies who um, position themselves in high temperature, high pressure drilling, directional drilling. Um, they potentially will own the future. And if you go elsewhere, let's see if I can get this moved on, there we go. Uh, if you look elsewhere, look at Larry Fink, BlackRock, his 22, 22 letter to CEOs. He's predicting that unicorns aren't gonna be tech companies anymore. They're gonna be uh, sustainable, scalable innovators and startups that help the world to decarbonize, the kind of companies that are going to develop the kind of technology that are going to enable the sorts of things that I've talked about over the last few minutes and that Andy was uh, talking about uh, earlier. So 
a good time to get into this business. And for reasons that I'll explain, the oil and gas business is very, very well placed to uh, take advantage and to, to help to be at the leading edge of uh, developing these, uh, these new technologies. And I'm going to quote Eric Van Oort from a, uh, an SP paper he published uh, last year. Um, deep geothermal is currently where wind and solar were about 20 years ago. And I agree with him. I believe it could well follow the same cost trajectory. If you look at the cost trajectory of wind and solar, cost reductions over the last uh, 10 to 20 years have been dramatic. Um, and uh, I think geothermal could follow the same uh, route and is a compelling in, uh, place for all of us in the oil and gas industry to uh, become involved. So it's a big prize. Um, how does wall construction help? Well, I've talked about thermal efficiency a bit. I've talked about economics a bit. Um, I've talked about things that I don't profess to be a global expert in. Um, I talked a bit about innovation and the creation of value. And the remainder of the talk isn't going to be about thermal efficiency or economics. It's going to be about the techniques and the knowledge that we might be able to transfer from oil and gas to geothermal and, and help us to enable that industry and, and become a part of it. And also some of the things that we might still have to learn. Uh, I'm going to talk about how we actually drill the wells, um, how we stimulate them, how we create the thermal paths underground, how we build surface infrastructure. They're the subjects of similarly long talks. There's not enough time and my knowledge is not sufficient to be able to talk about those in detail this evening, but I can talk about how we drill the wells. And uh, so that's where the rest of the talk is gonna go. That was, if you like, a very long introduction. Um, there's a couple of big challenges. And the first challenge, um, I've actually here called it uh, HPHT, high pressure, high temperature drilling. Um, I think it's more temperature than pressure. I'll explain why in a moment, but there are various definitions of exactly where HPHT starts. Um, this image was taken from uh, Schlumberger and uh, they talk about 150 Celsius, 10,000 PSI as being their kind of HPHT limit. If you look at API, they talk about 177 Celsius and 15,000 uh, PSI in the same kind of ballpark, slightly different numbers. Um, geothermal can be deeper and hotter than the oil and gas wells that we're used to drilling. So it could be that pressure and temperature become more extreme. Well, if you look at where geothermal wells have been drilled compared with some of our most extreme oil and gas wells, what you can see is that uh, the geothermal wells, they're identified as these red triangles and they're kind of clustered around the top left you don't see pressures like the pressures that we see in the oil and gas industry, but you see significantly higher uh, temperatures. The IDDP wells up to 450 uh, de degrees uh, Celsius, a, a whole cluster of wells in the 200 to uh, 250 degrees uh, Celsius uh, area. Um, we need to go deep. Um, this is the um, a map of the temperature gradient in the US from uh, SMU. Uh, to get above 200 Celsius, we may need to go down to about seven and a half kilometers. Um, on here, you can see the existing geothermal um, area in Northern California. Uh, you can also see the higher temperature oil and gas plays that we have in the Eagleford and uh, the Haynesville uh, down in the, um, the, the, the Southern part of, uh, you know, across Texas and uh, Louisiana. And, when you get to 10 kilometers, a lot of places open up and you get some very high temperatures uh, accessible to drill. Now, many years ago, I learned how to scuba dive. And one of the things that was set in my mind when I was diving is that uh, one bar of pressure, one atmosphere is 10 meters of water. Uh, it, you, you need to readily be able to recall facts like that when you're calculating what's going on when you're diving. Um, so at 10 kilometers, if it's water, we're at 1,000 bar or uh, 14,700 PSI, below 15,000 PSI. Um, often at those depths, there's no need to worry about well control and uh, ingress of uh, high pressure uh, fluids. So you don't necessarily need to use very highly dense uh, fluids. And so maybe it is more high temperature than high pressure that we, uh, that we need to worry about. 
Um, this is um, original source here, as you can see, it's gone through a few, it's been recycled a few times, but the original source being the uh, International Geothermal Association, uh, they put EGS and what they call DCLGS, Deep Closed Loop Geothermal Systems, we can call that um, Advanced Geothermal Systems, uh, you know, Everloop and stuff like that. Um, those things um, require, they're high enthalpy, they require um, 200 Celsius and above. Uh, and they're down at depths of, you know, sort of three kilometers down, uh, you saw on the last slide, all, all the way down to 10. And uh, that implies an operating range above 200 Celsius and up to about uh, 150 uh, megapascals. Sorry about the, uh, the, the mixture of units here. But generally, higher temperature, but not the extreme pressures that we see in extreme uh, HP, HT wells. Baker Hughes uh, just published their geothermal golden decade uh, document. You can find it, I'm sure, on their website. And uh, they claim in that document that three wells on a 400 Celsius project will produce more geothermal electrical power than 40 wells at 200 Celsius, um, obviously while uh, using fewer resources as well. So there is tremendous drive and I think tremendous opportunity in looking at uh, higher temperatures. Uh, so I think there will be pressure on us as an industry to develop solutions for uh, higher and, uh, and higher temperatures. Uh, maybe not 400 Celsius straight away, but uh, certainly higher than we can do at the moment. Because I compiled a list when I was researching this, I compiled a list of all of the com commercial oil and gas MWD directional drilling tools that are rated above 200 degrees Celsius. And uh, this is the list. Uh, there's basically nothing that our industry has, which we currently rate above this temperature. There are MWD and LWD tools that have been used briefly above 200 Celsius, but not very far above. But there's nothing which is commercial, nothing mainstream. Uh, there's nothing you could go out and uh, rent from a service company and drill a 210 or 225 or 250 Celsius uh, well with uh, at the moment. There has been development of uh, high temperature mud motors and a high temperature mud motor is, it's basically uh, a mud motor with uh, no elastomeric uh, material in the stator. Um, it requires a very, very accurate uh, machining of both the, uh, the, the rotor and the stator. Um, you see um, that the SP paper on the left uh, has uh, looked in some detail at uh, both the design and also the uh, field testing of such a thing. And uh, you see some images I got from a uh, commercial uh, website on the, uh, on the right to give you a bit more of a flavor of what these things might look like. The absence of elastomer means that they're likely to be able to uh, operate at a higher temperature, but the elastomer is there for a reason in, uh, in mud motors. Uh, it, it helps to uh, process uh, sort of uh, sand and uh, other solids and uh, get them through the motor helps to provide a seal, helps to prevent wear. And those are all challenges that uh, will have to be um, addressed uh, using, these, uh, using these devices. And I'll, I'll come back and mention that again in, in just a minute in a couple of slides time. Um, the, uh, the, the SP paper on the left was talking about aiming for a 50 hour life uh, to give you some context in terms of uh, the development that will be required uh, to, uh, to, to make these successful. But I think they, potentially have a big part to play. Drilling mud. Um, Water-based muds can lose viscosity at high temperatures. And so as we get to higher temperatures, oil-based muds are often preferred, but they're less environmentally friendly. So you know that if we're trying to produce a greener form of energy, using oil-based mud is maybe not ideal. And importantly, they also have a lower heat capacity because one of the things that our drilling mud can be helpful with is taking heat away from the various tools that we have as we're drilling uh, the well. Um, come back to that in a moment, but lower heat capacity is, is not a great thing. And there is a requirement uh, for a pathway to higher temperature water-based muds. Uh, there's a few references talking about water-based and uh, oil-based muds that are on the uh, slide here. And if you can't write down quick enough, I, I think there will be a recording, so I'm sure you'll be able to get them from the recording. Um, but it might be uh, the, the authors of the uh, paper talking about the, um, the, the metal motor, 
high temperature motor and uh, their um, 50 hour life. We're also suggesting that lubricants, uh, the addition of lubricants to uh, drilling mud could be needed to compensate for the lack of elastomers and to allow us to extend the wear of those uh, things like metal to metal uh, PDMs. Um, so what that means is that our drilling fluids could get quite complicated uh, in the future. But our rigs might get quite complicated too. Um, I, I talked a moment ago about the role of drilling fluid in taking heat away from components down hole. And um, it kind of stands to reason that the colder the mud is when you put it into the well, the, um, the, the, the more heat it's going to be capable of taking away from uh, downhole drilling and measurement uh, equipment as, as it drills. Um, surface mud cooling um, was used as long ago as 1990s to uh, uh, use um, PDM and uh, MWD, or at least eight sort of fairly rudimentary measurements uh, while drilling to control trajectory in uh, temperatures as high as 350 Celsius. So the industry has been there with uh, MWD and, uh, and drilling motors at high temperature by using uh, surface uh, mud cooling. And more recently, um, there are examples from Saudi Arabia showing how surface mud coolers were able to reduce downhole temperatures below the failure temperatures of tools and uh, extend the, uh, the, the life of uh, equipment downhole. Um, and most recently, um, uh, well, Utah Forge well that was drilled uh, is effectively like an experimental geothermal well uh, drilled in the United States, uh, claimed significant benefit from the, uh, the, the use of uh, mud chillers. And there's a few references. The, the, the cases I just referred to are in the references on the screen. You can use circulation of mud to pull heat away from drilling and measurement tools down hole. But if you stop circulating to make a connection, uh, the temperature can fairly rapidly increase um, and cause significant damage. And uh, there is a, oh, there's a reference I haven't got on the slide actually, uh, SP paper, I'll, I'll, um, I'll provide it after the talk, uh, which talks about how quickly uh, the um, uh, temperature can uh, increase and how quickly damage can be done. But we do have continuous circulation systems uh, that can help prevent this. There's a couple of references on the screen that talk about uh, continuous circulation. They've already been used on geothermal wells in Indonesia to allow higher flow rates and the uh, continued use of uh, high levels of LCM uh, in, um, in another case. Um, but they are a potential solution to allowing us to um, keep the temperature of equipment downhole below the reservoir temperature and allow us to extend the ability of uh, drilling geothermal wells just, just that little bit more. So I've talked about a few potential uh, solutions to the issue of temperature. There's a big challenge to solve with temperature, which I'm gonna to return to later in the talk, and that is how we actually build tools to uh, survive the downhole environment. But all I've talked about in the last few minutes is mitigation, really. Um, and I'll come back to that later, but there is another drilling challenge. And uh, the other drilling challenge is really the formations that, uh, that we're going to be drilling. Um, I was brought up in the southwest of England. And uh, so I was lucky enough to get uh, school geography trips and geology trips to uh, places like Dartmoor. And the image on the screen here is uh, one of the tours on Dartmoor. Uh, and for those of you who haven't been there or don't know it, uh, it's characterized by a lot of uh, granite outcrops called tours. Uh, and then, you know, as you can see in the background, nice, gently sloping moorland that uh, goes down between them. And uh, you can you can expend a lot of calories by walking between them because you're forever going downhill and, uh, and, and uphill. So I went there on a school field trip sometime in the 1970s. And we stood on the top of one of these. And uh, my geography teacher said, do you notice anything about these tours? And so, well, they're gray, kind of a bit pointy. Um, you know, they're, they're all quite high. He said, well, they're all the same height. And if you look across that, or the tours are all kind of, they're not the same height, but kind of similar height to each other. And the way it was explained to me is that um, these granite intrusions were present in sedimentary formations during the ice age. The glaciers came and scraped everything flat. And since then, 
uh, the sedimentary formations around have been uh, washed away to create these nice slopes that you can see in the background, but the tours, they're, they're made of pretty tough stuff and they didn't move. Uh, and so it is tough stuff. Uh, it's hard to drill, much harder to drill than the formations around it. And it's going to require a different approach to drilling and a different way of thinking about things. And so a second challenge after temperature is the need to be able to reliably drill uh, tough, abrasive, highly fractured formations, uh, which, by the way, are likely to have a much higher coefficient of friction than the rocks we're, uh, we're used to drilling. We're much more used to drilling sedimentary rocks at, uh, at lower temperatures. And uh, also, uh, by the way, the wells are likely to be bigger. Uh, just to make things a bit more difficult. Um, and again, I, I think Andy mentioned in his talk earlier about the importance of surface area. Um, a larger diameter well is going to give you more surface area and also allow you to get more fluid volume uh, and with its attendant heat capacity to be able to pull heat away from the uh, formation uh, as you drill. So they're going to be larger diameter. PetroWiki uh, seems to like to talk in millimeters, so between 219 and 340 millimeters. That's about eight and a half to uh, 13 and three eighths uh, in inches. Okay. Um, fractures means the potential for losses. Um, if we're drilling enhanced geothermal wells in particular, if we're looking to leverage the natural fractures once we've drilled them, then loss circulation material is probably not gonna be a good idea. Um, so EGS wells in particular are going to be less suited to that. And so we may have to fall back on techniques like um, air drilling or foam drilling, or we can use uh, things like uh, mud cap drilling, where although we do lose fluid to the formation, we're losing fluid, which is going to be uh, less expensive than the, uh, the drilling mud that we're um, going to be using to, um, to drill the well. Um, mud cap drilling or pressurized mud cap drilling it's effectively a specialized uh, form of uh, MPD um, and uh, often used for the avoidance of losses. And there's a few references on the screen that will uh, explain it to you if you want to uh, go into a bit more detail. Um, but mud isn't always used to drill geothermal wells. Foam or arc air can also be used. Um, but even if you use mud, uh, the coefficient of friction with the igneous rocks uh, tends to be higher than it is with um, sedimentary rocks. There are references that will teach you that stuck pipe can be a significant issue in uh, some geothermal wells. Um, because of the um, high coefficient of friction, you can get very high levels of, uh, of torque and drag. And the combination of torque and drag and the potential for stuck pipe and the potential for longer and deeper directional profiles um, means that wellbore quality is likely to be of uh, very high importance. And the smoothness of the wellbore, its rugosity and its tortuosity. Um, I, I, was, I did a distinguished lecture tour a couple of years ago when I was talking about the importance of wellbore quality and tortuosity to oil and gas wells. And I think it's likely to be doubly important for geothermal wells because of issues with friction and because of the, the, the risks of torque and drag and uh, getting stuck. Now, how do we actually drill these wells? Uh, there is a lot of excitement, uh, and rightly so, about a lot of different ways of, um, uh, of, of drilling um, igneous formations. Um, there's a company, Quasology, recently uh, rose, uh, sorry, raised um, forty million dollars in funding to develop millimeter wave drilling. Um, there's plasma drilling, uh, which is being developed uh, in the UK and in uh, Slovakia. And uh, one of the finalists at last year's Pivot 2021 New Ventures competition was looking at using uh, ballistics, as you can see in the picture on the left. And these are all really attracting interest, um, but. Um, I've omitted the, um, the, the name of the company because I don't want to make any commercial points, don't want to embarrass anybody. But it was interesting that one new drilling technique was recently compared in an investment article to nuclear fusion. Um, now, I, I told you earlier I was at school in the 1970s, which meant I went to university at the very beginning of the 1980s. And in 1981, 
uh, or maybe 82, I went to Cullum in Oxfordshire where they had the thing called the Joint European Taurus. And this was a nuclear fusion reactor that was going to produce energy um, in the next 20 or 30 years. Um, and the last time I checked, it's still a nuclear fusion reactor and it's still going to be producing energy in the next 20 or 30 years. So I kind of hope that these new drilling technologies aren't the nuclear fusion of geothermal. I hope they don't take as long as 20 or 30 years to uh, develop. But I fall back on Eric Van Ort and a very good paper that he uh, wrote last year where he talked about this is the list of these new drilling techniques, uh, impulse drilling, spallation drilling, impact drilling, millimeter wave, laser plasma. Uh, and he pointed out that um, there was a 1968 report that looked at novel drilling techniques that basically talked about all of that stuff. Uh, and so it was being developed in the 1960s and it's still being developed. So it may be reasonable to assume that it might not be commercial in the next few years. And I'm not sure that it needs to be, because here is um, a couple of images from a paper about the Utah Forge experience and uh, the use of PDC bits drilling uh, hard formations uh, and particularly drilling igneous formations and granites. And one of the things that's impressed me over the last uh, decade or so is the ability of the PDC bit manufacturers to make their products drill formations that we would just have thought were impossible to drill with this kind of technology even a few years before they, they achieved it. And uh, they've been able to push these products further and further and uh, harder and harder uh, to the extent that the uh, you can see the AFE for the uh, Utah Forge well, it was drilled almost twice as fast as uh, was expected, um, partly because of the use of PDC bits, partly because of the use of um, uh, sort of other oil and gas drilling technologies, partly because of um, sort of uh, drilling optimization. And, this is the results of a very recent um, drilling optimization uh, campaign in the uh, Philippines. Uh, the cost of drilling an entire section. Uh, what was discovered in this, and there will be an SP paper about this, I'm told, um, sometime in the next 12 months. Uh, so we'll be able to show more information then. But what I've been told about this is that it requires things like forensics, uh, study of the applications, optimization of the drilling process, optimization of the BHA, the bit design and everything, just the same as if we're drilling uh, conventional um, sedimentary formations, but the rules are different. Uh, the, the rules for bit design are different. The rules for uh, drilling parameters are different. And, and so we're learning how to do it all over again. But as you can see on a six well program here, we're learning pretty quickly. We've uh, almost cut the cost per foot of the section, the entire section, you know, sort of, um, sort of um, shoe to shoe. Uh, by 50%, by more than 40% in this particular case. Uh, there was a, um, the, the following section, apparently, uh, smaller hole size, the results are, are even better, but uh, I'm not able to show you those yet. But there is tremendous potential from just using the same technology as we've been using to drill oil and gas wells. So we may not need to get that esoteric in terms of, uh, of, of what we choose to use and what we develop. And the other big issue, I have to mention this with geothermal is uh, sour service. And particularly if you're drilling hydrothermal wells, if you get any exposure to hot fluids in the formation, you can get um, calcium ions, sodium ions, carbon dioxide, H2S, hydrochloric acid, ammonia, all of these things can be present. And uh, when you combine those with the higher temperatures we're likely to see, we're gonna have some significant materials challenges and some significant design challenges for the tools that we uh, decide to put down there. The rules, just like we drill bit, the rules are gonna be different. Um, still gonna follow the laws of physics. They're still gonna you know, sort of fit with the chemistry that we understand, but we're gonna to have to think very differently about how we design things. Uh, not that we can't do it because we know how to handle these problems in our industry. We, we understand sour service. We understand the impacts of uh, things like H2S and temperature. We just need to uh, make sure that we apply everything we know. I'm just going to jump back because it's something I forgot to mention. The other thing that was very noticeable, um, apparently from this particular study, not just an improvement in ROP, but also an improvement in hole quality and uh, tortuosity, uh, which is not altogether surprising, but um, it, I've just forgotten to mention it. It's important in the context of what I was saying earlier, we can actually use um, 
drilling optimization techniques to improve hole quality uh, as well as um, improving uh, ROP. And given the nature of the formations we're drilling, that high coefficient friction, that potential for torque and drag and stock pipe, uh, that's going to be very important. So we yeah, have apologies for uh, not mentioning that before. So how are we going to drill these horizontal wells? And um, if anybody saw my DL talk about well bore quality, you won't be surprised that I think that rotary steerable systems will have a, uh, a part in this because they will allow us to get the, the well placement, the accuracy of well placement, the, 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 the laterals which are parallel to each other that you may need for a number of the potential solutions we saw earlier. Uh, um, the tortuosity and rigosity uh, requirements uh, from drilling these, um, the, the, these harder formations. And they are actually starting to be used. Uh, this is a uh, geothermal installation which is being drilled in Hamburg in Germany. Uh, it's about three and a half thousand uh, meters, that's about yeah, 10,000 feet uh, TVD. And my understanding is that rotary stirrable, a conventional oil and gas rotary stirrable, is actually being used to, uh, to, to drill these wells or, or will be used to drill these wells. And this is the kind of tool that we think uh, we're going to need to drill those geothermal wells. Um, you note the integration of a rotary stirrable system and an MWD tool together. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one of them is cost, but the more important one is risk, because there's a lot of duplication between rotary stirrable and MWD electronics. They both have DNI sensors, they both have processors, memory. Uh, you know, a you know, whole bunch of uh, things that are similar. And so by building a single tool, you reduce the number of sensors, you reduce the number of electronic components, you reduce the number of electrical connections and so on. And that's really where the risk is going to be. We will be able to figure out how to build uh, high temperature steering heads. I mean, rotary steerable systems, they all have metal seals in them in these days anyway. So there's you know, no issues with elastomers. Uh, limits and fits might have to change, material selection might have to be carefully thought about, coefficients of expansion, but a good engineer will know how to do all of that stuff. Um, we have to be able to prove that we can make uh, downhole electronics and sensors work above 200 Celsius and potentially significantly beyond uh, 200 Celsius. And that's where all our challenges are. And that's why if you go back to the slide I showed earlier, there are currently no commercial 200 C plus um, drilling, uh, so MWD or LWD tools. And the reason is that um, plastic packaged electronics just won't get there. Um, the, the traditional approach, which has been spectacularly successful, I have to say, in oil and gas drilling tools, has been to take existing commercial plastic packaged components and just push them and push them and push them. And I can remember when it was a big deal to get from 120 Celsius to 150 Celsius. And now 150 is pretty standard. And a lot of people will operate 175 or even 185. And um, I don't wanna, I guess I'm gonna grossly oversimplify it. You buy a bunch of electronic components, uh, you put them in an oven and you see which ones survive and then you use those. And it's a lot more complicated than that, but, but a combination of screening and selection enables you to sort out the weak ones and uh, allows you to use the uh, the, the stronger ones uh, as you're building uh, tools. But you run up against diminishing returns and the difficulty becomes uh, asymptotic as you get closer and closer to uh, 200 Celsius. And if you get to the point where, I don't know, 40 or 50% of your tools are failing screening when you get to 200 Celsius, how many are going to be on the ragged edge by the time they go down hole? And uh, don't you really need 100% of your tools to be passing screening at that point? Don't you need everything to work reliably at that point in order to be able to push on and get to 220, 230 uh, or whatever? That'd be much better. And so how do you do it? And our industry has come up with a couple of ways of doing it um, over the last uh, decade or so. Um, this one, uh, subject of an SP paper, which also spoke about the, um, the, the, the full, uh, the high temperature downhole motor I showed you uh, earlier, uh, one of those images. And this is a 300 Celsius MWD tool that um, operates in a 300 Celsius environment, but uses a combination of uh, water evaporation and uh, absorption 
to keep the electronics at a maximum temperature of 175 C for about 100 hours. Um, so basically you're taking heat out by uh, evaporating the uh, water. Now, when you run out of water, you run out of uh, cooling capacity, so you get a, have to get out the hole pretty quickly after that. Um, it might last for about 100 hours, which is not quite as long as you'd need, but it's in the ballpark. Um, it could well work. My instinct all the way through my career with innovation and product development has been to make things as simple as possible and as easy to repair as possible. And there's certainly more complexity in this than there is in a, a standard 175 Celsius tool. The other way is, uh, and this is actually from a, um, a paper from a company that's made a 200 Celsius LWD tool. It's not rated above 200 Celsius, but it is rated to 200 Celsius. And this was achieved basically by a ground up redesign of all of the electronics where the plastic packaging was all thrown away and uh, dyes were created either based on the uh, components that were being replaced or um, uh, application specific dyes. And, um, uh, different packaging, different materials um, used to uh, put these boards together. I have actually seen this one work up to about 210 Celsius uh, on one occasion. Um, there are other tools that are rated to uh, similar uh, temperatures, but I, I have experience with this one and have seen it succeed at high temperatures. So this gives us a clue about a way to go, which is maybe not trying to use those plastic package components and maybe not trying to build 175 Celsius boards, but building a board that could look very different to what we've seen before, but which will still operate at higher temperatures. Now, luckily, we're not the only people trying to do this. Um, we've got a lot of help from adjacent industries. Uh, this is uh, an artist's impression of what the surface of Venus might look like. Um, I've had conversations with uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena about work that they are doing to try and develop uh, electronics that would work on what's going to be a fairly short-lived Venus rover. Um, and their specification, I think, is for the electronics to work at 480 Celsius for 500 hours, which is kind of mind-blowing from the perspective of what we've just been talking about and the electronics that we're used to in this industry. Um, but that, that's what NASA is going to have to do. Now, we're not going to take NASA's electronics and put it into downhole tools anytime soon, but there is the potential for a long-term technology transfer there. But the space and the aerospace industries are looking at higher temperatures uh, for components. Um, for example, um, it's better to have sensors and um, measurement and monitoring control electronics closer to the combustion chamber on a gas turbine engine than in a, uh, a cool box uh, some distance uh, away on the outside. And so there is pressure to increase the temperature capability of uh, the electronics, which is used uh, in places like that. And 225 Celsius seems to be a kind of magic number in terms of the potential availability of technologies that could be imported into oil and gas and, uh, and leverage. And so there is the potential for us in the not too distant future, you know, the, the very close foreseeable future, to get from uh, below 200 to up to about uh, 225, and then maybe use technologies more like the ones that NASA are looking at to uh, springboard to maybe to 300, maybe maybe even beyond. Um, you do that by building things in a very different way. Um, Multi-chip modules um, are microchips that have um, basically a very different structure. I, I think. Um, one definition is uh, silicon's uh, substrate density higher than 30%. We would probably use different materials, maybe use silicon carbide or even diamond instead of uh, silicon. Uh, one of the great things about MCMs, as well as their potential for temperature resistance, is the fact that you can build them so that they have a very low aspect ratio. They're very light and they're very short and close to the board compared with uh, more conventional uh, techniques. And if you think about drilling in uh, things like granite and the potential for increased levels of shock and vibration at temperature, then having stuff which is uh, squatter and uh, shorter uh, could be a big help in terms of um, uh, in terms of reliability. And uh, the other thing is taking heat away from the uh, electronics and getting heat from the electronics. And even in ambient temperatures, uh, electronics can get pretty warm. You know, listen to the fan the next time it goes off on your uh, laptop and put your hand over the processor and 
you know, put your hand on the uh, side of your iPhone after you've been using it for uh, a while, and you'll see how hot electronics can get. It's very, very capable of doing it just by itself. Um, and the use of uh, esoteric materials to take heat away from the components and ultimately get it to the cooling effect of the uh, drilling mud flowing past it uh, is potentially another big part of the uh, solution. We have um, a few examples here. Uh, the, the, the right hand image is actually some of the work that NASA is doing on their uh, Venus lander electronics. And we can see very high temperature packing and uh, MCM multi-chip modules on the, on the screen here, just to give you examples of the kind of things that we might be looking at. And so we go back to the onion, remember the layers of the onion and the need for those enabling technologies to be, be available at the right time. I think if we look at the downhole electronics that we're gonna need, to give us the intelligent tools that we need to put these wells in the right place and maximize their value. Um, progress in other industries means that, and progress in materials technology means that the layers of the onion that we need to be able to develop this high temperature stuff for geothermal are just on the point of being revealed or have just been revealed. So we're not like the guys um, in uh, the telephone company in 1953 who are dreaming about smartphones. We can actually see the layer of the onion that's been pulled back to uh, give us the, uh, the the technologies that we're going to uh, to need to go ahead. So as an industry, I think this is something that we can do. And if people say to you, we tried this 10 years ago and it didn't work, it's because that layer of the onion really wasn't visible 10 years ago, whereas now I think it is. So then thinking about thermal decline, I, I'm going to conclude in a minute, but those multilaterals where it was necessary to switch between the legs, well, how are you going to do that? And if you have the ability to create high temperature electronics and to put automation downhole at high temperatures, you're going to have systems that can monitor the reservoir and potentially switch autonomously between legs to absolutely optimize uh, production, heat production, and therefore electricity generation from the, uh, from the downhole environment. So once we discover and once we create the downhole processors, sensors, memory, comms, A to D converters, all of the things that we need is not just going to allow drilling and measurements. It's going to allow us to do logging, intelligent completions, and the production monitoring, the production optimization I just, uh, I just spoke about. So to conclude, um, new technologies transformed and scaled unconventional oil and gas, uh, horizontal drilling and that had taken years itself to develop, hydraulic fracturing that had also taken decades itself to develop. If we take our expertise in oil and gas and we take the new technologies that are available to us and we combine that with decades of experience, because you know, as a planet, we've got decades of experience of drilling geothermal wells. It's just that some of the people involved in drilling the wells and some of the people involved in the technologies I've talked about haven't always talked to each other as much as they should have done in the past. They had no need to, now they do. If we put all that stuff together, I think we can scale geothermal to previously unimagined heights. And on that positive note, I'm going to stop. And I'm going to thank you. Um, many of the references uh, that are in the presentation and many more are in an SP paper that I've uh, co-authored with um, a colleague, uh, Steve Crace. That's going to be presented at the uh, drilling conference in uh, Galveston in uh, just under a month's time. So. Um, some of the references that you'll see in here and some others as well, uh, you'll find in that paper. So uh, thank you for your time. And uh, Tim, I'll leave it to you how you want to yeah. handle questions. Fantastic, John. Thank you so much. You're very, very interesting. Well, we've, a, a few people have written in the, uh, uh, in the chat box. So I'll just read these out. So Mohammed uh, Halad says, do you think mud cooler or even high flow rates will be helpful for drilling deep geothermal wells beyond five kilometers? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, there is a slightly longer answer. Um, and that is that um, for, you know, mud, mud, mud cooling will definitely help on the surface. Uh, I mentioned that in one of the slides. High flow rates will help because uh, one of the strategies we'll use to help these tools to survive is pulling as much heat as possible out of them using the, uh, the, the drilling mud. That also, that comes back to a point about thermal capacity of the mud and the difference between oil-based and water-based muds and why it's gonna be important to develop water-based muds. Um, but high flow rates, you know, the higher flow rate, uh, the, the more heat 
potentially all other things being equal, the more heat you're going to be taking away. The reason I said there's a long version of the answer is um, high flow rates requires big pumps uh, and uh, mud chiller has implications for the design of the rig as well. So um, at the moment, there should be no shortage of uh, rigs capable of doing this. There may be competition from oil and gas drilling at the moment, given the prices of those commodities. But in the long term, uh, it may need um, additional sort of high power, high capacity, particularly uh, high flow rate rigs uh, to be uh, to be built. These rigs will be drilling deeper as well, so and, and they're drilling larger whole sections. So we'll probably need to have a generation of um, you know pretty high end land rigs to uh, to to do this. That's just a good point. I mean, you know, you said, "Can we do these for five billion dollars?" And then you're you're well, heaping everything onto it. So as you say, you're going to be using. I don't know what the completion is going to be, nine and five eighths or something like that, or seven inch, you know, and the amount of rock you're moving and just the size of the equipment and the rigs, surely that's going to just push your uh, your well costs uh, above your five your five million dollars. Yeah, and the, the, the size of the rig and the scale of the uh, the, the, the scale of the um, operation is a concern. And I haven't got calculations that I could show you now to to uh, indicate where I think the, the cost is going to go. But what I am heartened by is the way that we were able to reduce the cost of uh, drilling unconventional wells, because one part of the equation is the rig rate, but the other part is the number of days. Yeah. And although there'll be people on the call now who are sniggering because they've heard me advocate in the past that we shouldn't prioritize penetration rate above all else, because it can have very adverse effects on completions and production. But if we do learn how to safely drill these wells much faster um, by using things like um, rotary steerable systems, by uh, understanding how to use uh, PDC bits, there may be cases for combinations of PDC bit technology and some of the, um, the more esoteric technologies I talked about earlier on, you know, P PDC bits with um, sort of, you know, particle assisted uh, drilling and stuff like that. We could, if we can significantly increase the speed at which we can drill these wells accurately, we reduce the number of days and uh, that goes a long way to mitigating the, uh, the the equipment we're going to need in the higher rig rate and and also if we if we're drilling them as um on, on pads so you know if we're drilling multilaterals and stuff like that um you've got the rig on location and so that that makes the process more efficient as well a couple of questions i'll read out uh so from philip ball hi john that's you uh, do you know what happened to the Sintef tool used in the de-scramble project and then uh, philip gives us the, uh, the link to um, a paper in uh, 2017, development of a novel logging tool for 450 centigrade geothermal wells. I say, hi, Philip, and the answer is no, I don't. But uh, what I'm going to do is uh, capture the link from the chat before the uh, end. <laughs> <laughs> OK, yeah. Uh, it's the, yeah, so he's given the reference to that. OK, so uh, John DeWart uh, um, from, says, uh, Utah Forge shows significant rugosity of the well bore after they improve the drilling ROP. So essentially through removing limiters, what tools or processes do you see to deliver a low rugosity well bore? Low rugosity well bore, sorry. Good, good question, yeah. And um, well, John, uh, good question. And I, I know I've talked to John about this. I think I even quoted John uh, on this topic in the, uh, in the Dale talk about the importance of uh, rugosity and tortuosity. Um, and I don't want to contradict myself. I don't want to contradict something I said earlier. It's not just about drilling the well faster. Uh, I think what they did at Utah Forge was um, remarkable in terms of uh, proving uh, ROP. They didn't have access to all of the tools that they needed. They weren't able to use stuff like RSS, which can significantly improve uh, rugosity. And uh, I think, as I said, when I was looking at those data from the Philippines, one of the things that was learned in that process is that the the limiters and the, um, the the application characteristics are very different to the ones that you get when you're drilling sedimentary rocks. So I, I think the answer to that question is a better understanding of what's good and what's bad when you're drilling uh, igneous formations. I don't think we fully understand that yet, but I think stuff like, to some extent, Utah Forge and to some extent the Philippines work uh, and other examples as well uh, will show us the way and will allow us to get a low rigosity well bore uh, um, with still high higher ROP. But 
one, one of the messages I put out in that DL talk is that single biggest change you can make is use a rotary steerable system and uh, you'll get a much smoother world ball. Um, and well, you, you heard me talk at length earlier about the importance of that. Okay, uh, so Jesse Yakabi yeah, has uh, changed the subject not substantially. Let's not forget about the application of artificial intelligence whereby oil and gas has excelled. We can tap from the experience too and apply the same to geothermal. Yeah, I, I think so. And I, I think drilling optimization might be one area of doing that. Um, and uh, I think machine learning for stuff like production optimization, um, especially with the challenges associated with production from closed loop wells, could be another great uh, opportunity. And uh, Richard Dool, uh, formerly from Imperial College, uh, now I believe retired, uh, very great talk. What sort of area needs to be drilled to get a decent heat output for power generation? Temperature, volume of rock developed, and water output. What sort of pumps are needed to get the water to surface? So quite a few questions there. You might look at yourself to uh, pick up, pick them all up and answer them. Quite a few questions, yeah. Um, the, the, the diameter of the uh, production well bore tends to be larger in geothermal than it is in oil and gas wells. I mean, whereas in oil and gas wells, we'd often be, <clears throat> excuse me, producing from six and eight, six and a half inch, or maybe eight and a half or eight and three quarter, eight and three eighths. Um, in geothermal, it seems to start at about eight and a half, eight and three eighths, and it'll go up to 12 and a quarter, 13 and a half, 13 and three eighths, that kind of, uh, so, so the wells are, I guess on average, the wells are about twice as big in terms of, uh, in terms of diameter. Yeah. Uh, then when you start to talk about laterals, uh, there is a, um, there's got to be an optimal lateral length, which is a function of um, the flow through the, uh, through, through the lateral, but also things like the heat transfer from the rock and the amount of time it takes to uh, recover. And I, I, there's still work being done on that. Uh, one of the references in the paper, the, the Bolander reference, is, is a good place to look and get an idea of how that um, of how that kind of trade off might uh, might take place. Um, pumps to get the water to the surface. Um, good question, and I don't actually know the answer. Potentially big ones, um, but uh, there could be some um, there could be some benefit that comes accrues from uh, uh, convection. But uh, I, I think, uh, I, I don't know how big those um, pumps are going to be, but uh, the pro potentially see you've got a long length of, uh, of, of pipe to get fluid through. So potentially uh, quite a lot of, um, of, of, of power in the pump. Okay, so Eric, uh, or Eric uh, Murgadal says, uh, do you have any experience in using turbo drills or turbines in geothermal drilling? I believe they have a temperature limit around 250 centigrade. Yeah, uh, that's a very good point. And personally, no, but I think they might have been used at Utah Forge. Um, and you, you can build directional turbines. Um, uh, I mean, a, you, a downhole turbine will drive um, a, the bit in just the same way as a downhole uh, motor will. Uh, you, you, you may, maybe you'll put a gearbox on the bottom of the turbine to get a more closer to a normal drilling speed. But it, it could, you can always think of it as a black box replacement. Uh, they do have a higher temperature uh, limit than uh, PDMs. And I believe that they, can't say this for certain, I believe that they were used at Utah Forge. On the subject of which, uh, John DeWart's come just back with some factual information about the Utah Forge. They use PDC bits, which went from 15 feet per hour to 60 feet to 100 feet the last step using a change in drilling fluid. So that's just information for everybody. Yeah, thanks, John. Good information and good point. Yeah, uh, about the uh, about the drilling fluid. Okay, uh, is there any else, any other questions or comments that people want to uh, put in? It can be, as I said in the previous talk, you know, tangential. You don't have to anymore stick to the subject. You can uh, talk about things that uh, occur to you as a result of hearing this talk or any Andrew's talk. Does anybody want to venture any such opinion? Um, Mark, Mark Anderson says, John, Utah Forge was a vertical well. How will RSS help? Uh, good question. RSS can help in vertical wells by reducing tortuosity. Um, and I've seen, I don't want to get into a pitch for RSS here, but I, I've, I've seen examples in um, uh, the central United States where 
vertical sections, 12 and a quarter inch vertical sections have been reduced from taking, you know, tens, 20, 30 days to drill down to just a few days by, uh, by using rotary stirrables and by avoiding the kind of crooked hole issues that, that you might get there. But I think RSS is going to be more important um, if, as I believe, we're likely to uh, use um, to, to drill laterals. And uh, John's point is a good one. I, I think Forge did have a um, deviated section. Um, I, I, th I think it had a tangent section um, after the vertical. And Peter, you have your hand up and, and you're actually I, I, not on mute, so go ahead. And hopefully you can hear me, yes. So John, thank you for that. Um, just how soon or how long do you think it will be before the drilling techniques that you're aware of and are, are coming down the line will actually be good enough to, to, to make deep drilling economical? Uh, there's a there's a number of questions in there. The, the, the first one is about how soon could these drilling techniques be available? And I mean, uh, I don't want to be too commercial. T T Tim said earlier on that uh, I'm, we have our own company that's developing some of these techniques, and we're hoping that we'll have something within two or three years. So it, it's in the, you know, between now and the middle of the uh, the decade. Uh, so the the technology availability could be fairly quick. The issue is that it's enabling technology. And um, so nobody's going to drill these wells until they're convinced that the technology exists to allow you to do it. So there's a bit of a chicken and egg situation there. But uh, yeah. there appear to be plenty of people who are interested in uh, high temperature um, drilling and measurement systems and who are interested in drilling either directional or um, horizontal wells. I've talked to, you will be surprised to talk to a lot of the companies who are looking at unconventional geothermal wells. And uh, the, the message is, it's not exactly the same for everybody, but there's a very consistent thread that runs through it, which is, yeah, when this technology exists, we'll use it. But um, the, the, for an enabling technology, the take up time is, uh, you know, <clears throat> you're not going to see it used all over the world in the first year, but we would uh, expect to see technology available to do some of this stuff within uh, uh, two, two, three years. Uh, John DeWalt. Yeah, John, thanks for the presentation. Very good. Um, my question comes back to all the novel drilling technologies, so laser and plasma. And yeah, as Eric pointed out, they were around in the 70s for sure. And some of these entities have managed to secure more and more research funding to keep on doing research. But some of the ones I've looked at on a, on a geothermal project, they didn't actually have an appreciation of the means to take the power to the bottom of the hole. They just imagined they would drill on coil or something like that. And then they didn't have an imagination of how they were going to circulate fluids to control the wellbore at the same time as drilling with those, those uh, technologies. What are your thoughts about those technologies? Are they just going to be pie in the sky or is one of them actually gonna break through? My, my feeling, and I, 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 I don't wanna make a, a, a kind of a, too much of a personal journey through this, John, but I agree with a lot of what you said there. And uh, I think um, these technologies have been around for a while. Uh, they are very cool and very exciting and they are attracting a lot of funding. And what I'm gonna say is a generalization. So it's not necessarily true of, uh, of all of these um, sort of technologies before somebody uh, sort of uh, jumps in and um, starts yelling at me, but there are cases where conveyance is gonna be a challenge that hasn't really been addressed. Uh, there is one I've seen where they talk about there's, there's a little cutout in the um, in a schematic that says the high temperature electronics will go here. Um, so so somebody needs to develop that high temperature electronics, and, and yeah, in some cases uh, it's difficult to understand how uh, the, the the need to remove the rock from the for, from the well um, is is consistent with the way that it's going to be drilled. Um, for example, if if you need a clear fluid, um, are you are you going to be able to use a clear fluid to, uh, to to lift the cuttings that inevitably will be produced and get them all the way up to surface? And so some of those challenges, I think, I'm, I'm sure those challenges are being thought about. Uh, I guess what I'm going to say is we haven't yet seen the evidence that those challenges are being addressed. And, and my concern 
for that those technologies is that by the time they're ready for prime time rotary drilling and pdc bits could be so good that we're not going to need them before i uh, read alfred's uh, uh short note um i, I was actually when I, while you were talking john i was scrolling through my emails because um I was uh, shown a, a solution to the very problem that John DeVart just mentioned, which was use mud. So mud motors generate the power. Uh, and of course they take away, take away the, the cuttings, et cetera. But the particular, the particular application was interesting, although I, I, don't, I don't have any uh, knowledge about whether it would work or not, which was to, um, was how you use plasma drilling, which is then powered by the mud motors, uh, to, uh, to, to focus only on turning the granite beyond the rock bit uh, into a sandstone-like substance, whilst at the same time uh, not not damaging the sides of the well bore in in the in the area. So you have to focus only on the area just in front of the well bit and just in front of the bit. Uh, you you break that up into uh, in, into a, a rough rock and then you crush it with the PDCs. But um, I I just mentioned that there is such a, a thing, John DeWalt. That's a good point, I, and yeah, that's a very good point about um, if you assume that you need about the same amount of power to uh, destroy the rock as you do with a with a conventional bit, then a mud motor is going to be capable of providing that. So uh, yeah, but, yeah, but it, you you know there's going to be efficiency and stuff like that, but but in principle at least it, you're in the right order of magnitude for that to to work. So that's a good point. Yeah. Okay, uh, Alfred Ndabodi. On, sorry, Ndor Bili. Uh, thank you, John. How has seismic data for oil exploration been helpful for geothermal exploration? You, you need to address that question to a, um, a reservoir engineer and not to me, because if I answered that question, there's a 50% chance I would, uh, I'd mislead you. Um, but what I will say is I, I think that there's definitely going to be a place for both logging data and uh, data which allows us to understand the... Uh, the nature of the subsurface and you know it might be that we're interested in different things we might not be so interested in things like um sort of uh, porosity um or density but we might be more interested in uh, fractures uh in fact we could be very interested in the presence of fractures and, and faults and stuff like that uh for some of these uh systems fractures could be really helpful um faults could um sort of um scab in, uh, you know sort of steal all of the uh all of our working fluid, for example. What, what concerns me a bit about, I mean, I think earlier in either of your presentation or Andy's, they're talking about the depth that some of these wells might have to be, you know, five kilometers if you want to get regularly to the, uh, the, the sort of 250 centigrade type solutions, um, is that you're, you might be drilling through formations that need, need to be cased off. Um, and therefore, you know, I'm just watching this, this uh, well, well going down and down and down until you're back to the, you know, three and a half inch, um, you know, that, that seems to be, I, I just hear, it keeps bugging me that to say, well, yes, once you get down there, it might be hot, dry rock, but you've got to go through potentially dangerous formations, shallow gas, etc. Yeah, you, you may do. I mean, uh, hopefully um, a lot of it will be fairly shallow. Uh, there'll be aquifers, most places where you're drilling, you'll have to drill through those and case them. And then also insulate yourself from them because they will be, they'll be delighted to take all the heat off you. And, right. uh, you know, they'll, that they could extract significant like uh, charge tax as you uh, as you flow it through them. Um, it, it may be that you know that we've learned how to drill for oil and gas in parts of the world where it's uh, prevalent. Uh, we, we we know how to find where the basins are, and we um, that there are some countries have been sort of very blessed with those resources, and others not so much. Um, hot dry rock is going to be present pretty much anywhere. It's just a question of how deep you go. But it may well be that we need to understand the subsurface sufficiently that we know that there aren't um, sort of uh, deep pockets of oil or gas or any other or, or water or whatever under pressure that are go going to cause us drilling hazards as we uh, as we drill. So maybe we have to pick our uh, locations a little bit to, uh, to, to help us to resolve that. Or maybe we have to, as you say, understand how to uh, control the wells and um, may maybe use uh, Maybe use casing, you know, multiple casing strings, or maybe use expandables or whatever to uh, be able to, uh, to to manage those uh, situations. So, uh, Alfred, I think as part of your answer has already just been told by John, or they didn't realise he was answering your question, which is uh, you look for the bright spots and you don't drill anywhere near them. <laughs> okay, any other? <laughs> maybe that's it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> There's your answer, Alfred. Um, anything else that people want to uh, to raise, um, or even really just. Off the wall comments. You don't. You don't need to. Uh, you know, have a direct comment. You can. You can even make a comment and ask, not ask a question. 
John, you've just seen, unmuted yourself, John DeWart. Does that mean you're going to say something off the wall? Yeah, the one thing Hello? that hasn't come up, and it's probably off John's uh, scope here, is the earthquake issue. So if you go and fracture granite rocks, hard metamorphic rocks, they often tend to release the energy significantly and suddenly. And some projects have been stopped because of earthquakes. I mean, how's that going to play out, John? Have you looked into that at all? Of course, it's the advantage for a closed loop system. It, it is an advantage for a closed loop system. Um, my understanding is, uh, I'll, I'll give you both sides of the story, that there have been examples uh, where um, drilling of um, enhanced geothermal systems, unconventional geothermal wells, has been stopped because of um, induced seismicity, or seismic activity. Um, there aren't very many. Uh, but one of the things that I've repeatedly seen is that the pressures uh, used are not the same as the pressures that are used when we're um, sort of fracturing uh, uh, unconventional uh, wells uh, in shales. So um, if you believe that, then the amount of hydraulic energy is going to be less. And then the probability of seismic activity is, uh, is, is going to be less. Um, Induced seismicity, that, that, that's a whole, you know, you know if, we were, if we were there in person at Imperial College um, and we were going to be talking um, sort of uh, late into the night after this, I'm sure one of the topics that would come up would be um, sort of unconventional oil and gas drilling in Europe and the opposition to it because of seismicity. Um, but maybe now contrasted against the potential of not having any gas. Um, and you know, either the cost of energy or the um, the availability of energy might change our, our societal attitude towards that. I'm not saying that induced seismicity is a good thing, just saying that maybe our uh, tolerance might change a little bit in, in the light of higher energy costs. I think it already has, John, because if you look at the uh, the, the standards to which the, um, the, the, the Cornwall drilling, I think also a potential Devon drilling, um, uh, the, in terms of induced seismicity, they were equivalent to what it is for uh, quarry blasting in terms of the tolerable, the tolerable levels for uh, seismicity and, and drilling. So, so you've got oil and gas wells, uh, which have, you know, the, this ridiculous, I'm sorry, I didn't mean political, this, this very stringent um, uh, requirement in the UK and, and all in Europe. And then you go to drill a geothermal well, all of a sudden it's just equivalent to quarrying rock, and therefore you can use dynamite to blast it, and therefore you can certainly feel it on the surface when it happens. So it's already happening in the UK anyway. That's a good, that's a good point, and I don't want to, with a risk of deviating too much, before I went to university, I went to, um, in summer break at school, I, I went to Nottingham University for a week to learn about coal mining. Uh, and the National Coal Board wanted to uh, persuade me that coal mining was the career for me. And we did a mine planning exercise and um, basically you, you, you cut a seam um, and then you allow it to collapse. Um, and what they said was you need to plan your mine because we're not allowed to um, sort of uh, mine under hospitals and schools in case they collapse, but houses are fine. Yeah. So you've got an industry that's allowed to bring your house down literally compared with an industry that is not allowed to produce minor earthquakes. And yeah, and so there could be a realignment of our uh, tolerance to uh, seismicity. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure there will be, yeah. Okay, Any anything else that uh, comes up again? I, I like the, uh, I, like, I like off the wall comment, anything that uh, that you can think of that will inform the whole discussion, but provide a new perspective. Try and, try and be creative and challenging. Surely somebody must be creative and challenging. Well, Payam Akto has just joined us um, in the closing minutes. So Payam, would you like to give us uh, anything that's, uh, that's creative and challenging to add to this? Go ahead, Payam, you've come off mute. Maybe not. Okay. I, I want to say thanks to Alfred for his comment, geothermal all the way, I love that. <laughs> okay uh yeah all right i think i think we're done so um thank you john uh, very much indeed I, I thoroughly enjoyed that um really uh, an extraordinary canter through all sorts of challenging technologies um let's uh well best of luck with your own company uh, getting somewhere in the next three years but also for all of us i think uh that um, some of the things that insights you created will make us uh, use geothermal in an economic way throughout the world i wish you all uh 
uh, good night. Um, and one thing I would like to ask, although there are only uh, 40 people on the call, on the call now, is um, if you if you want to give a talk on geothermal energy, then uh, please write to me. Um, and uh, you'll find my, uh, uh, so for example, Chris um, and Mark, you two perhaps would be interested in giving a talk. Um, and it will go to a global audience like uh, these have. And it's not related to the London section exclusively. It'll be throughout the world. Uh, and it'll be part of the geothermal technical section, um, uh, which I also uh, uh, host. So do, do write to me if you're interested. You'll find my email anywhere, really, um, certainly on all the invitations. Uh, and uh, I look forward to talking to everybody else uh, in, in March. Um, and so good night. Thank you, John. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, John.